In the White House, President Eisenhower signs the proclamation that makes Alaska's entry into the Union official, nearly 92 years after Lincoln's Secretary of State bought the territory from the Russian Tsar for $7 million. The Alaska Wild Project podcast is brought to you by the following sponsors. The Bait Shack, located on Ship Creek upstream of the bridge. Can't miss the bright red shack. They're the go-to fishing gear rental and guide service on Ship Creek. Tight lines and fish on. Come hook into the action with them. Hit them up at thebaitshackak.com. Lawn Pro AK, your year-round professional property maintenance company, providing services such as weekly lawn maintenance, driveway sweeping, snow and ice management, and tons more. Get your free estimate today at LawnProAK.com. Anchortown Dogs, located at 4th Avenue across from the old 4th Avenue Theater. Look for the blue and gold umbrella. From reindeer dogs to bomb euros, they've got you covered. Anchortown Dogs, your local gourmet hot dog and sausage cart. Menegato's Accounting, locally owned and operated advisory and tax accounting solutions. Passion, experience, diligence. Learn more at menegatosaccounting.com. Double Shovel Cider Company, located off Arctic and 58th. Handcrafted Alaskan made cider. They also have a tap room downtown on the corner of 5th and E. Check them out at doubleshovelcider.com. Serrano's Mexican Grill, two locations, one on Tudor, one on Northern Lights. The Northern Lights location has their new tequila bar. Check it out. Also see their daily specials at serranosmexicangrill.com. AKO Farms, located in Sitka, Alaska, built from the ground up with concentrates as their single motivation. Find their products such as their sugar wax, full spectrum diamond sauce carts, and more at the Treehouse AK and other dispensaries around the state. Ask your local bud tender about AKO. The TreehouseAK.com, located at 341 Boniface Parkway, your all-in-one cannabis and CBD store. Ask the bud tender what the strain of the day is to get your 10% off. The Treehouse, where the culture lives. Marijuana has intoxicating effects and may be habit forming and addictive. Marijuana impairs concentration, coordination, and judgment. Do not operate a vehicle or machinery under the influence. There are health risks associated with consumption of marijuana. For the use of only by adults 21 and older. Keep out of the reach of children and marijuana should not be used by women who are pregnant or breastfeeding. Tailored Restoration 24-Hour Emergency Home Services, helping Alaskans restore their dreams since 1972. Services include fire, water, mold, post-emergency cleaning, repair, and remodeling. Give them a call in Anchorage, Eagle River, Matsu, or Fairbanks. Hit them up at tailoredrestorationalaska.com. Kind of, in, kind of in sync that time. Yeah. yeah. We're getting better after episode 20. I thought it would start getting old, but uh, it's still... It's, it still tastes good. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that never changes. That part never better. changes. That yeah. Just oh, oh, man. And we got the new uh, double shovel grapefruit lavender that just got uh, canned today. Oh, yeah. Today, Jack? Yeah, Annie and I were canning it down there today. So was there a grapefruit... And then a lavender, and now it's grapefruit lavender? No, it's always been the GFL. Oh, yeah. oh, <laughs> yeah. shit. Can yeah. I get a t-shirt made that says GFL? Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm a GFL man. <laughs> yeah. La- lavender uh, in a beverage is an acquired taste, I think. It, um, so it is for some. Yep, for sure. Yeah. You get like, it's, a, it's kind of like a black or white area. There's no gray. Um, so it's like, oh, I got soap in my mouth. Mm. Or it's like, oh, I love the wonderful, <laughs> refreshing smell of the lavender with the, you know, the yeah. acid so tartness of the grapefruit. And so it's like, okay, yeah, you're a soapy guy. It's all yeah. good. Well, it seems like it's toned down a little bit. I'm sure there's a lot of trial and error. Oh, like yeah. Like sometimes it's, it's very, very, like the first one, I remember you when you guys did it like a year or two ago, it was super lavendery. Yeah, yeah. It might be a little acquired you know, now that you say that because I think it's the same amount of lavender. I oh, mean, it is. I know it is. Yeah. So, okay. it, but it doesn't like maybe get used to it. The soapiness doesn't hit me like it used to. Yeah, and I'm not gonna lie. Like the first time I had it, I was like, ah, it's kind of gross, but I, I need to give it a <laughs> chance. You know, I was yeah, like, yeah. it's just so unique and different, and like this is just yeah supposed to be good. Yeah. And then I was well, it's like, like a kid know, when you start drinking later. beer. It's like, Ugh, but I'm just gonna finish this Mickey's ice. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Hoppiness is the same way. Yeah. So yeah. May, maybe it is a little bit acquired on that. And I, yeah. I, I didn't really think about it. Yeah. I, I wanted to, I mean, it, it's like not to be misconstrued as like a, a negative on lavender. It just is something that's like dark coffee or an IPA on the back of your tongue mm. or <laughs> oysters. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's like yeah. Some people like it and some people are like, that is disgusting. And it's just all good. It has this I love crazy it. cult following. So yeah, uh, yeah, I'm very happy about that. And it's really refreshing in the sun. Mm. Oh, okay. It's like that mm. summertime. Yeah, hot. yeah totally. That crispy. Dude, it's been so hot. Like, look, we're just all just, mm. I look yeah, like I'm from Columbia brown. now. Yeah. Mm. I walked in Aren't today. I was from like, Columbia? I, I looked, I was like, I know, but I look like it. <laughs> I can see your t-shirt and hat, but you're like blended into the wall. Yeah. Just white <laughs> teeth. Yeah. You need to wear a white t-shirt. Yeah. A white tee. <laughs> yeah. That place sitting on that beautiful white chair. I was like, okay, he's right there. There he is. <laughs> I can see him. This is a shadow. <laughs> Uh, a good problem, I wish though. I would have had it this weekend, but I didn't have it this weekend. So. You didn't. Wait, well, yeah, okay, hold on. Let's yeah, go well, on. Well, welcome just, to uh, episode right yeah. yeah episode twenty two <laughs> of the Alaska Wild Project podcast. Um, thank you for everyone that's been listening. Um, we're getting a tons of feedback on Instagram, on our on our Gmail account, um, on Facebook. Just people hitting us up with all kind of questions and. We're getting a lot from uh, out-of-state people that are wanting to move here or they're coming on vacation next year and they want to know, hey, sh what should I do? What's What do you suggest? Who's this? Who's that? Where can I buy this? Um, I got an email the other day about kids' clothing, like kids' outdoor stuff, like what are some places that we can go and buy them or online stores that are reputable. Because a lot of that times you go to find kids' stuff at – wherever you know target or wherever you go and it's not gonna make it in no. the alaska weather you know yeah. so they want to know like find, what's man. what do you buy yeah. for your it, kids is like the question you get yeah wow. i love helping parents when they're like hey man where can i find some rain gear yeah i'm like uh yeah i know that, that during this time of year rei has a good selection i know that in the spring beforehand you go to sports and warehouse they have a legit selection like there's little pockets of time if you know as a parent you can be like yeah. bam resuit 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 yeah and then you know two years later because you buy it a size too big yeah yeah and you try to make it last but it's fun because i it's hard really hard to find kids good quality it is kids it equipment. is so anyone that's maybe really looking just as i as i gave this information to the person that emailed me in and around anchorage there's a couple hot spots you already mentioned those two yeah um also big rays has a lot of good kids selection yep, yep. Um, Local. Sixth Avenue Outfitters, I want to say, mm -hmm. probably has the best like water boot selection for kids, like the m kids muck boots. That's like one of the places that you can actually go yeah. and find them. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. you know, decently priced. You know, and those aren't those aren't cheap. You know, yeah. those are. I actually put my kids in those in the wintertime, um, because they're waterproof, they're knee high, they're zero degree. You know, or you can get the minus twenty or whatever. But they're just gonna run through those all year and and rock them during the summer. Yeah on the boat and stuff like that. And it just, you know, you got to know where to find these little right. nooks. Yep. yep. So the for kids clothing, for me, it's all about that Oki wear. Yes. So like the, you can get the full body suit mm -hmm. and, the, and it's just a shell, but yeah. it's, it's legitimate just like Gore-Tex shell. Some coveralls. You know, it's yeah. awesome. <laughs> Waterproof. And then, uh, <laughs> but you can get the top or bottom separate and they also make a muck like book boot that the kids can get on and off easy. And my kids wear those in the winter and the summer. Yep. So it makes it real easy. Is yep. that is that hard to get though? As uh, far as like yeah, Oki, okay. mm -hmm. is well, it all special I, order? Or is it local? Yeah, well, their mom gets everything, and gotcha. she gets it online on sale. So, <laughs> okay, um, so a couple things with that, because yeah. I did suggest Oki wear too, because we've been mm -hmm. rocking their stuff, and they're always expanding on their website. They have really cool waders for kids that already have the boots attached. They have the other style that's like neoprene style. Yeah. They have the full body suit for young kids. Yep. And I want to say that Big Rays now is one of the distributors awesome. of Okiwear. Oh, um, so you could actually go there and see what they have or go to their okiwear.com right. and, oh, and you get know their another, website. Um, is B&J's. Yes. B&J's has a really awesome supply, rain boots, waders, but rain gear too. Yeah. Uh, for youth, like racks of it. Yeah. You know? and, and as families, as you know, and we see your texts all the time, like, hey, you know, your kids grow out of stuff in a year. And then oh, you got man. someone else with little yep. kids like, hey, man, these boots Pass are still good. Yeah, yeah. You know, this rain jacket's still good. Like, right. pass it on down. Yeah. And don't don't ever um, not think about um, some of the. Uh, 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 what am I thinking of the. Uh, 
hitting up Facebook. No, well that too, but some of these stores that that you just go and give Goodwill. Oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Salvation yeah. Army, Salvation yeah. Army, yeah. places like that. Like you can Village. produce through there and get yeah, stuff like that. Use. Oh, for sure. Yeah, because we give away tons of stuff. Yeah. People that you know, if if none of our friends really took it, then it's, we're dropping it off and and yeah. giving it away because if it's still good, at least someone else can use it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I highly recommend the second use thing because it's like if it doesn't get used, it gets thrown away or, you know, why would we go spend money on things that within a year your kids grow out of? You don't know what's going to happen to that gear. It's not like us buying a backpack or whatever and we're using it for 10 years. You know, we got to leave this place better than we, we showed up. Yeah, yeah. So Oki Wear is O-A-K-I Wear, W-E-A-R, and I believe that's the website as well. And Big Ray's downtown. Yep. And I'm assuming Big Ray's, the one in Midtown over there, has it as well. Um, as far as since we are going to get into the boater safety and we'll get to our guests here in a minute. Um, another question that we get is, is where do you get like kids life jackets Yeah, and stuff like that? And a lot of times Costco has them um, mm -hmm. and then they run out. Um, I've seen them at some of the other local places like Alaska Raft and Kayak has mm -hmm. some of those higher end ones. If your kid is starting to get into actually being on their own kayak or whatever. Yep. Um, some of those, you know, they're more restrictive than others. Um, some of them are a little bit more high tech or a little bit less foam or thicker foam. So, you know, there's different styles depending on what your kid's going to be doing. The yeah. Costco ones are legit. If you can find your kid size in them. Yeah. Like Stern's brand or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Costco, uh, and it seems like, and we'll get into this with you girls. Um, they have like two different styles of, well, there's probably multiple styles, but you find the style that is. Um, more like uh, jet ski kind of style mm -hmm. versus like boat style. Right. Does that make sense? Yep. It's like a different fabric. Like, like a neoprene. It's like a neoprene. Uh, it's kind of tight. Thinner, or in the yeah. water. Yeah. It's like for like water skiing or, or tubing. Yeah. Right. Like a cooler. My kid said, these are cooler. You know? <laughs> yeah. They're probably it's, cooler when you fall, fall in the cold water. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> You're going to be a lot deeper my, and floating wrong. My 12 year old this weekend, we're, we're floating out on South Raleigh on one of those little cheapy Danish, you know, 10 foot diameter rafts. You know, my brother's had it for years and we just, it's still just holding air. And we're, we're on there and, and she's, um, she can swim and, and I will let her swim on occasion. Um, but she has her life jacket like with her and, uh, She's like, she's wearing it and she's like, dad, this life jacket sucks. And I'm like, how does it suck? She's like, well, you know, it's just like so big and bulky and like restrictive. I can't swim in it. I'm like, you don't seem to think it sucks so bad when we're ripping on the jet boat at 40 miles an hour in the rain. And if you, God forbid you flop out of this boat, you're going to bob right up and float down the river. And she just looks at me like, oh, shit. but she's right. She's thing. right. I, because there are like, yeah. like I have these life vests that I take my sons on the raft and on boats that's can go over rain gear and can go over all the yeah. layers yeah. and it's bulky and it's like, it's not really for swimming or being right. active. It's just right. like for safety. Whereas you get some of those other ones they are almost like custom fitted and a little bit tighter to wear just like on your skin. Yeah. You yeah. know, so that you can be out there paddling and swimming and around. There's like and, training ones where they're like, and it's not like so it floating up more. here, like you know, you're looking like <laughs> I'm floating, like a, but I, uh, <laughs> yeah, like a ground squirrel, you know, like popping hey, the set up. Hey, look, we swim like two or three times a year. Yeah, we boat like fifty times a year. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, sorry, kiddo. Yeah, your shitty ass sucky life jacket <laughs> is gonna keep you alive. Yeah, S some and of these so white got. water ones. Though, <laughs> well, come fit on, like and it's this nice skin. too, man. It's a like nice the one. one that I have. Like it's small. It's a white water one. I forget what rating four or whatever it is. Oh, you yeah, know, you fall, on you them, fall yeah. in the water and white water know, and it keeps your head above. I mean, but it is <laughs> kind of small. And what's great about it is like you've tested them on a hot day. You float down the river. I just floated in two days ago and it, it floated my head up and it floated my chest up and my legs are wherever they need to be, Yeah, but it's super comfortable. They just don't make little kids life jackets like that right. where you pay a lot for that. Yeah, yeah. They do actually, we're getting a thing here. Um, so let's introduce the guests here, but before we get into the guests, really a couple things we want to, um, wait, let's introduce them. Yeah. Let's wait, just wait, wait to introduce them. More more real quick. I, I definitely want to give a shout out to the Patreons. We've been getting a yep. lot more people yep. that are getting on the Patreon. If you want to support, Support Alaska Wild Project. Um, basically, there's two ways to do it. You can go to alaskawildproject.com and buy some of the merch. 
all that money is being reinvested so that we can continue to get cooler stuff and continue to bring in these guests and do these videos. Um, another really cool way is the patreon.com. You go to patreon.com slash Alaska wall project. It's $5 a month. We have some really cool things. If you listen to this past week's episode, um, once we get to 100 patrons, we're going to release some crazy stories. Once we get to 200 patrons, we're going to release some really yeah. extra crazy stories. That's the, under, that's the underground recordings that the uh, public hasn't heard. So. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of cool stuff like that. So thank you to the people that have been doing that and um, supporting us through that way. We really, really appreciate that. Um, thank you to the people that have been going to Heather's Choice and putting in the promo code Alaska Wild for your 15% off. Um, all that, like we said, goes to help, you know, multiple Alaska businesses. So thank you for that. And the last thing I wanted to mention before we move on is the Coho Rodeo, um, mm. August 7th, the bait shack. Saturday, August 7th, down at the bait shack, down at ship Creek. It's a one day event. Grand prize is a thousand bucks. Um, he's got all kind of stuff lined up, man. He's got a whole bunch of new merch down there. It's going to be packed, man. He's going to have food trucks. He's going to have all kind of things going on down there. It's going to be a blast, man. So that's Saturday, August 7th, down at Ship Creek, um, the entire river. Bring your gear. If you don't have gear, obviously, he's going to be renting stuff down there um, for that. And they're already catching the silvers, man. They're catching the silvers down there yeah, like crazy. Yeah, are getting limits every day. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. That, that water has just been boiling with fish. Yeah, dude. It's like I the mean, hottest, like river yeah seems like I, I don't know if there's any fishery that anybody can just go down to walmart grab a rod and reel and, and <laughs> head on down and you get after it then they're putting fish on the on the grill that night or you can rent it from from dustin go straight to the bait shack he's going to completely outfit you he has guides that can get you on the sweet holes out in the river and uh in the creek and it's i mean what he's doing is just it's fun man yeah. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Watching what's going on. There's just, it's alive. Ship Creek is like back. It is. You it, know? It really is. It's like, bubbling down there. It sounds a little dramatic, but I mean it's like I grew up here and it like wavered in its popularity and like Yes. I loved it and then hated it and uh, the silt and the filth and all the stuff. But like you just go down there. If you just go down there and take your kids for a walk and just watch it and Yeah. Well it's, it's not as it's not as like scary you know? or something as it used to be. There's there's less homeless down there, it seems like. Um, and unfortunately, it seems like homeless have kind of spread maybe more towards Midtown. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so it's it's really cleaned up down there. It's really nice down there. Um, well, they the restaurants the open. projects that they do, too, where the area, you know, Dustin and his crew are taking care of the place and yeah. they're doing their part. Um, it's a true community difference. Yes. I guess. Yeah. Good right? way to put it. Yeah. Good way to put it. Yeah. Um, so let's move on to our guests. Uh, we have Olivia Drown here and Cosette Isaacson from Alaska Boating Safety. Um, the Instagram is at Alaska Boating Safety. But what is the official, like you guys work for the state of Alaska? Uh, yeah, we work for the state in the uh, Department of Natural Resources under state parks. Okay, so Department mm -hmm. of Natural Resources, state parks, slash Alaska Boating Safety. Yeah, Alaska Office of Boating Safety. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Um, I uh, I know Olivia from hockey um, from back in <laughs> oh, the day. Really? Olivia is a hockey player. We used oh, to play awesome. on a co-ed team long, long time ago. Uh, yeah, I started playing on your team nine years ago. Yeah. yeah. Something like that. Hey, yeah. Olivia. Awesome. Which team? Bring it a little bit closer. Right. Um, it was a co-ed team. Just um, like, grab it and bring, bring I don't remember what the name of the team. Yep. What was the name of the team? Uh. Well, it changed like multiple times. I don't know what the original name was, but it ended up being called Pucked Over. Yeah, I think this is something <laughs> like that. <yeah. laughs> uh, which sounds just super weird. Um, and that team actually is no longer a team anymore. No, it's not because we had the um, the guy, the couple from Alaska Mint that owns Alaska Mint. They were oh, on there too. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, that's actually another guy that we need to bring in there. And, yeah, and what's his to. name? Mike. I want to say his name is Mike. Yeah, Mike yeah. and Michelle. Yeah, Mike and Mike Michelle. And Michelle. Yeah, they got a lot of cool stuff going on down there. Um, so we, we've kind of been hyping up, uh, bringing in uh, Cosette and Olivia in here to talk about boater safety. Um, boating is something that a lot of Alaskans do. It's something that we do. Um, there's different types of boating, and safety is, is surrounding all those boating activities that's going on. Um, so give us a little bit of rundown on... Um, some of the things that you guys are targeting or your goal or maybe your mission with uh, the boater safety for the state of Alaska. What's the message? Um, so we 
currently um, a lot of our programming is actually geared towards kids. Um, we do have adult programs, but um, a lot of it is geared to like getting them used to the boating safety message so that as they grow up and become like boaters as adults, they're so used to that message that it's instilled in them and then they can share it with everybody around them. So it's kind of creating that um, safe boating is like an everyday activity kind of thing uh, where it's not like, oh, we have to think about the safety. It's just something that happens and it gets mm. done Comes every natural. time you go boating. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of like when you get in your car, you put on a seatbelt, right? Every time you get in the car, it's a safety measure. You do it. Um, so we want that to be the boating safety message as well, um, especially here in Alaska because we have that cold water. Um, it's really important to have um, your life jacket on at all times when you're on a boat um, because if you end up in that cold water, you're going to go through cold shock, and it makes a really big difference if you have your life jacket on and on correctly. Great, great, yep. Close that. Yeah, I would just add, um, I think that's true. Our main message for boating safety in Alaska is talking about cold water, so most of our classes, whether it's for kids or adults, is cold water survival. Um, we also talk a lot about prep. A trip planning, preparation, passenger safety. Mm-hmm. Um, we offer a lot of different classes for kids and adults, but mostly it's just educating people because there's a lot of misperceptions out there and wrong ideas about th- people think they know what happens when you fall into cold water or how long it takes before you get hypothermia. Or they have all these things they think they know, but in reality, there's there's a lot of wrong ideas out there. So that's kind of <laughs> one of our main goals is just helping people correct those mis- misperceptions and be prepared for the reality of the danger of cold water. It's mm, really well said. Oh, that's exactly right. Yeah, and and yep. and these I waters up here, appear, I know these waters. Ugh, it's like yeah, you, well, right. you know, it's a different story if you fall <clears throat> on the water in Kentucky than if you fall on the water in Alaska. I mean, we're talking glacier fed. This water is freezing. You know, and I want to actually go back to we were talking about the um, life vest. And you said, and Olivia was like just listening to us, and like we were talking about like the, the, the cool now. life vest and the other life vest. <laughs> Can you kind of maybe one of you guys break down the different maybe types of life vests and what's maybe best for certain situations or for children? Yeah, absolutely. So there's there are tons of different styles, designs, types of life jackets, different materials, different colors, um, and it really mostly comes down to what kind of boating you're doing. Um, so you've got paddling jackets for paddling. We talked about, yeah, you got like a white water life jacket. We've got the ski vests for water sports. Um, we've got float coats, offshore life jackets, near shore life jackets, inflatable life jackets. There are a lot of different types. So you can look into kind of what type of boating you're mainly participating in and go off that. But I would say the one of the most inf- important factors is, well, is fit. That's the most important one is that it fits you. But also, like, comfort. So if you're near shore life jacket, your, you know, typical general use boating life jacket they have is really bulky and uncomfortable and you don't like it and you don't want to wear it and you're tempted to take it off, then that's no good. So find one that kind of matches your body type and that works for you. And that, you know, that is the one that you're going to be willing to wear all day long on the boat. So some styles just work better for different people and, and there's a lot out there. Now, between the different styles, I mean, obviously, some are, so mostly it's for fit. Yeah, so you can check the check the label, make sure it's, you know, like you've got the chest size and weight on the label there, so you can look at that. But then you can also just try it on, fit it, you know, tighten the straps, zip it up, and just see how that works for you. Some of them just work better for different people. And then for kids, obviously, it's... it's um, the law, the life jacket law in Alaska is anyone under the age of 13 is required to wear a U.S. Coast Guard approved life jacket on an open boat, on the deck of a boat, or when being towed by a boat. So kids under 13 have to wear them. For adults, it's just that you have to have one U.S. Coast Guard approved life jacket per person on board. So the life jackets do have to be on board, but you don't have to wear them. But for kids, they have to wear them, um, and they make, you know, youth sized, child sized, infant sized all different sizes and they do come in all those different styles so too you can get a youth paddling jacket or a youth ski vest or those different things so if you if your family is really into you know a specific type of boating you can look into that um and there are places in town i think you can buy a lot of those like we've got west marine is one um yeah, sixth avenue resource. outfitters does have a lot of life jackets and um, they donate to our program a lot um that's cool not sure where else, but do um do life jackets have a like a life like do they expire? 
No. So there's no expiration date on a life jacket. It just depends on how well you take care of it or how you're storing it, things like that. So as soon as a life jacket has any kind of damage, so that could be any rips or tears, even if they're small, missing buckles, broken zippers, any kind of mold, mildew, or damage to the flotation material, it's no longer serviceable, so it would no longer be considered U.S. Coast Guard approved, even if you, you know, it's kind of an Alaskan thing to just put some duct tape on there or try to sew it up yourself. Don't do that. That would be (laughs) altered. It's no longer Coast Guard approved. Um, You know, but that could happen. If you're not taking very good care of it, you just leave it out in the rain or leave it out, you know, in the snow all winter long. That could happen faster versus you could have a life jacket that's really old that you've have kept a really good care of and, yeah. and it'll last. Yeah. I think a lot of people misuse their life jackets too. Throw them in the boat and they just yeah. get sun bleached and rained on. They're not and seat yeah. cushions. Yeah. Right, yeah, right, totally. yeah. So what are the different types, the type rating? Um, so you have like the type one life jacket, which is your offshore life jacket. So ocean oh. water, um, they're a little bit thicker. They're going to be that big bulky kind of uncomfortable, but in an emergency situation in the ocean, you want something that's going to keep you higher out of the water. Right. Most of those also have reflective gear. Um, yep. they have like a, the regular buckle and they usually have like a metal clasp as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's your type one and you have your type twos, um, which are like your near shore life jacket. Like we've all worn that un like that orange horse collar yeah, style yeah. around the back. They're super convenient. The reason why they're so popular is because they're kind of inexpensive. You can buy them in bulk. So summer camps are like, hey, we have one that fits everybody because of that really long string. Um, with those ones, like the youth ones are under 90 pounds. The um, other ones are over 90 pounds. So if you have some of both, you have them. That'll fit pretty much everybody. All right. um, in that also, that type two, you have those, um, the regular near shores, like the ones we use that are, life jacket loaner board station mm-hmm. which is the red ones um they're the vest style those are general everyday um kind of every kind of boating style ones um so those ones are also pretty inexpensive and pretty easy to fit on multiple people those ones come in the infant child youth adult and adult oversized you can find them in like kind of more specific adult sizes but those ones get a little bit pricier and then you have um your type threes which are kind of like your specialty style ones um in that classification you have the paddle jacket um which is that shorter on the stomach like the white water Mm -hmm. um it's gonna have less padding on the sides less padding on the shoulders so you can do all that motion um, and then you also have um, kind of in that same thing, you have the ski vest, which the Costco life jackets. Um, I get those every every time my kid needs a new one. Um, she gets one of those, um, and they're good for the, like, faster boating. So jet ski, water ski, mm-hmm. tubing, something um, that cushions a little bit more compressed. It's got the thicker buckles. It's going to stay in place a little bit better. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of fits with, like, if you're wearing, like, a wetsuit while wakeboarding or something oh, like that. Oh, ski vest is in like water ski. Yeah, as in water yeah. skiing, oh, okay. jet skiing, like, tubing, yeah. something where you're going faster along the water. Against um, the skin. Um, yeah, you can put it, uh, we put it over jackets and stuff too before. So um, it's like it a better does range of motion, well. right? It's like it allows you to it's be a little able to closer. ski and like have like uh-huh. your... A lot of them actually use, have you know? kind of an extended piece in the back, and it kind of, like, helps support, like, your spine, your ribs. And oh. that padding goes all the way around. Like, it goes all the way from shoulder to hip, belly button to back, like, covers your entire what, core. What was the type 3 again? So, um, we had the offshore, near shore, and then type 3 is a what? Those are um, kind of near shore specialties. I don't know. Near, near uh, shore specialties? Yeah, that's kind of how we okay. describe them to the kids and yeah. how we describe them to most people. Because um, the, like, technical terms of them are um, a lot of people don't necessarily pay attention to that part. Um, but you also right. have um, kind of all your extra ones, which are the type fours. You have like throwable devices. You have um, inflatables. You have uh, oh, yeah. your float coats, which um, so inflatables and float coats aren't deemed a life jacket if you don't have them on. So like um, a Mustang suit, you mean? Uh, or, not not the full suit, like okay. just a float coat, which looks like a winter jacket, but it has oh, um, inherently buoyant Mustang material. makes those too. Oh, Mustang does. Oh, that, that doesn't count as like if you get pulled over on the boat and you only have that. If you don't have it on, it's not. Um, it so count. a good okay. thing to have, like like if you're duck hunting in the fall and you put on that like jacket yeah. first thing in the morning because it's cold out, and then like you're out there all day and it gets nice and warm and sunny, you're gonna want to take it off. So the best yeah. thing to do is have a backup life jacket as well mm-hmm. on your boat because once you take it off, it's no longer deemed a life jacket. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would just add that if you have one like that, like an inflatable or a float coat or something you're just not sure about, you can check the labels. Some of them are... are Consider um, both? 
are both, or okay. you know, you could have a hybrid. They make these really cool new hybrid inflatables that have some inherent buoyancy. So if you fall in, they will help you to float. But then if you feel like you're in a situation and you got to pull that tab, they'll inflate to more. Got and it. so anyway, I'm just going to say, you know, check the label because they'll tell you if, if it does need to be worn to be Coast Guard approved, the label will say that if you're just not quite sure. I, I have a question about the inflatable. And we're talking like the nice, comfy, pull the thing, or you hit the water, it senses it. So I have gotten into those, and I love them, especially when I'm doing like uh, toting four-wheelers around on the boat, and you're doing kind of weird hauling of equipment and stuff, and there's like they can hang up, and a big bulky life jacket sucks. But if you wear that, I'm just wondering, is that thing really, the ones I have, I'm pretty sure I have to pull. And I've, I've recharged them. I've done the whole thing. I got them inspected. They're legit, but I haven't had to use them. And I almost want to just like jump in the water and, and pull that sucker to see like, what is the reality of when you pull that thing and how it like makes you float and yeah. buoyant? Like, can you even swim with that damn thing? Or are you just, is it? it I mean, certainly that along with the horse collar or the offshore are, they're harder to swim in. They're good for floating. Okay. It'll float you really well, yeah. but they're harder for to emergencies swim in. is what, what they are for is yeah. what I Kind of and normally, to. I would definitely recommend to people, you know, try your life jacket on mm. in the water, see how it performs in the water, because mm. a lot of people, yeah, have no idea. Yep. But obviously, with the inflatables, it's expensive because every time you pull that, yeah. you got to recharge it with a CO two cartridge, and that's something you have to buy. So, it's up to you if you. Yeah. But if you feel like you really want to know what that might be like in a real situation, it might be worth. Well, I bought it extra out. cartridges, and I think I might give it a shot because totally I've never thought it. about it, and I'm like, you know what. I wear one. I, you know, we're we're running our our doing our thing during moose season, and I give my two buddies because we're you know we're back and forth on and off the boat, and I'm like, look, first year we did it, we were just kind of willy nilly doing it on and off with life jackets. It was like, yo, this is really, really, really freaking dangerous, and we need to just have them on full time. Yeah. And so it went to that, and then it went to like, man, we need to quit these bulky ass things off, and then get those. You know, yeah. those collar style. And so I invested and they're sweet. It's just like, this yeah. is really going to well, save my, my life? My question with that, like when know. we go on your jet boat and I see you wearing that thing. Right. And I, I asked you before and you were unsure. <laughs> exactly. If when you fall in the water, does it know automatically or do you have to pull that yellow tab? Because my thinking is if you fall in the water and God forbid you hit your head. We well, you might not or, be conscious. Or you conscious. panic because as soon as you hit that cold water, the first thing you're not thinking is pull this yellow thing. The first thing you're thinking is like swim to the top, you know, or whatever, especially if you fell in in a crazy situation. Is that, are all of those like automatically they inflate once you hit the water? I don't believe so, no. So it could be either. So there could be um, ones that automatically inflate. There's some that you have to pull and there's some that are that are both. So you can check yours if it has the little uh, dissolvable bobbin in there. It does. That so when that dissolves, it'll automatically inflate. And then if it didn't, you could pull the tab, right. or you can usually manually inflate them, like you know, like the ones you have on the airplane. Okay. And what's in. the time frame of the dissolving of that? It's real quick. We do okay. it sometimes at our pool sessions with kids just to show them. You just and throw so it in the water. We have someone put it on. They jump. Oh, in. Oh, okay. Does it's, it have to be on? It's quick. Well, like I mean, just no, it's just well, touch say the that's water. The other thing I mean, is, you know, if. That's another thing is those inflatable life jackets aren't great for everything because if you're out in heavy rain or getting splashed all the yeah. time or sea kayak or something where it's going to get wet, that bobbin will eventually dissolve just from that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Got it. So that's something yeah. to think about well. Mine don't. They're manual. So, like, I accepted that I actually take that chance that I have to be well aware of the situation if sh shit goes bad that I'm going to... Yank Let it, it rip. There, but there's again, that. you can bonk your head or something. Even the automatic ones happen. come down to, you know, a little bit of, yeah, acceptable risk just on right. a personal basis. Yep. Because even if yep. you have the bobbin, you know, there's always a chance with that mechanism that it could fail and they're not inherently mm -hmm. buoyant. Um, so it mostly, and again, you can check the label for these to check, but you do typically have to be 16 years old to wear that as your U.S. Mm. Coast Guard approved okay. jacket because yeah, of that. Know. Yeah. yeah, there's tons of research around, you know, you get an emergency and if you haven't trained for it, you're not going to respond. Right. So, I mean, people yeah. that are using yeah, these pull, pull ones, you really should be practicing. Yeah, no, you're right. Well, Jack. just like we were saying I mean, with the bear spray thing on, on one of the other mm -hmm. podcasts, like you got to practice with yeah, these who, who tools. Who does that? Who actually you know? is like you have? 
Yeah. It turns no, out that, that they're... No, please. They're, like, they're yeah, right. shed some light on that. You actually yeah. bought a can and um, let it rip or what? So we had a, a like a pack of cans and one of them was going to get expired soon. So sure. it's like you have to either get rid of it or use it. Um, so we were actually um, hiking and we were in a pretty clear open area. And a friend of mine, uh, we had like three canisters with us. There were like eight people. Uh, we were actually in Valdez. And mm -hmm. um, he's like, Lots you know, I've never shot there. one of these. Like, we, we should try it. And then he was like, I, I, I don't want to pull this tab. And so um, I'm going to pull in the tab. And um, so it was really not uh, what I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to like just like kind of spray out, but it actually has got a kick to it. So um, it, I would definitely suggest trying everything, bear spray, life jackets. Um, I've jumped in with a pull tab life jacket on before um, and kind of tested it out. But that was like a really long time ago. I've never done it in Alaskan water, but... Mm. Um, it's really important to like kind of see how your life jacket works, especially in the water. Even if you don't have like, um, an inflatable life jacket, just your regular life jacket, yep. um, before you go boating, like try it out, yeah. go down yep. to like Jewel Lake or uh, little Campbell and just like yeah. jump Watch off the dock and, and see what out, happens. Yeah. Swim. Um, yep. you know, it's really good for you to know kind of how it feels in the water. Um, and then you can also like see if you actually tightened it properly in the water because your life jacket moves around a little bit, especially when you yep. jump in and you can always like wiggle it down a little bit and retighten the straps. Like that way you can tell if you're actually going to float properly and how the different ones float. Yeah. You know, those near shore style. I don't like how those float, <laughs> you know, the yeah. these type three ones that I use, I've been using for a long time. That's the same style you have on your boat, Daniel are the the ones we float with in our rafts I, those are much more enjoyable to float in and you can swim in so yeah. make it when you go test these things then you know what you, what you want to swim in yeah you know? and it's a good thing to know your personal preference with life jacket um because if you're going to be doing these heavy activities where you're doing a lot of paddling you're doing a lot of moving maybe you want something that's a little bit more low profile um if you're just using it for an emergency maybe you don't need the lower profile higher price life jacket right. um so it's it's all up to like kind of your decision on so what life jacket you're going to wear yeah, what's your application right what are you yeah. doing yeah. yeah but the one that's most important is the one you're going to actually put on and leave on so yeah. the one you're going to wear is the best life jacket for you yep. so the ones that you pull the tab um is it like how do you is it a one time use or can you yeah. restuff it yeah, my understanding is if you're, you're asking, you're looking at me. I'm so looking I, at you because, but you've never <clears> tested <throat> it, so maybe actually. No, I mean, I, I, I can tell you just from like a person who just randomly was like, "Hey, I got, I happened to get one for free. I had it checked out. It was legit. It was like a, it has like all these sponsored things on it. It's like some rafter dude had it, and I was like, oh, this thing's cool.' And then I ended up buying two more guide series Cabela's ones that are like really good quality. They're like three hundred dollar life jackets. I didn't pay three hundred dollars for them, but. I got a smoking deal, and then I, they were brand new with the tags, and I had to put new charges in them. But I have not tried them out. But the little green tab is good. Like, it says pull. It's full. So, to my knowledge, they're one-time use, and they have an expiration date. Yeah, not correct? so I would say yeah. really important to read the owner's manual and the label on mm -hmm. those and, and do what it recommends. Because usually, it's a I book. think it's once a year, you have to replace that CO2 cartridge, even if you didn't use it. And then obviously, if you do use it, it needs to be replaced. So, yeah, as far as, you know, restuffing it, that part is easy. You just let the air out and fold it back in. But the the cartridge needs to be replaced. And then if yours has the bobbin, that would have to be replaced also. You should see the um, the attachment on the branding label and then the, the book that's like yeah. zip tied on the mm -hmm. life jacket. Like mm -hmm. you, you got to take some dikes and like mm -hmm. snap that thing yeah. off and like read it. Yeah. yeah. I would Reject say anybody who's buying any kind of life jacket, even if it looks like a really basic life jacket, don't just pull that off and throw it away. Like we all do with everything, you know, yeah. read it because some major yeah. stuff you might hanging be surprised. Off those things. Yeah. What, mm -hmm. what kind of important that's information great. is great Cause I can tell you, I have been that person. Mm -hmm. I just bought a whole slew of life jackets for my family over the last five years. I got kids little from to, to teen age or age. And so I've got tons of life jackets and I can tell you right now, just honestly, I have never opened that book and read the whole thing. I just put them on secure, tighten them. They've swam in all of them. I feel good about it. And I've just gone about my business, but honestly, I've never read it. And I'll tell you what, right now, the next time I buy a freaking life jacket as a commitment to you ladies and everything you do, I will 
read that damn thing. I promise. Thanks. I appreciate that. I really will. I <laughs> yeah. really will. I really, really will. Good. Because, man, Good. that just, like, was a cold shot to reality right there. Like, yeah. damn, that's me. Um. Along with the life jack thing, I think one of the the coolest things that I have seen kind of take over lakes and rivers is the kids don't float yeah. deal. And oh, everywhere, everywhere you go yeah. is there's life jackets there. Yep. You go to the Kenai, you go to the Kisilof, you go to South Raleigh, you go to yep. any of the lakes – there is a sign there and pegs with the kids don't float thing. Is that your guys' program? That is our program. Um, nice. We have some partners that help us help us out throughout the years, but um, the Kids Don't Float Lo Life Jacket Loaner Board program um, is a program that was started um, in the 90s. Um, actually, it started down in Homer by some local people um, to address the kids drowning um, in the state of Alaska. So um, as to date, we have... Um, 635 active loaner boards in the state of Alaska. Oh, sweet. Um, there are some inactive ones that we're trying to get re-sponsored. Um, there's about 170 inactive. Um, but so what happens is... Yeah, so... Um, Dang, how much did it cost to get those running? We need to get some people on so, this shit. So um, it actually is uh, a program where... Um, People throughout Alaska, a lot of programs like Alaska State Kids, um, a lot of um, state troopers, or um, kind of like park rangers. Um, there's a couple of police stations. Like it's kind of like local um, people throughout communities want to start these boards at like dock launches or boat launches, um, kind of wherever people are using the water for boating, and they send us a kind of like a request or a registration for a board and then we actually send them um the life jackets the decals um the only thing they're responsible for is setting up the board and um so every fall our office um, does a registration for these boards from september to november and if you need new life jackets or you need a new decal or there's a board that um, you noticed isn't being sponsored or isn't being taken care of, you can kind of register on that thing. And um, it's on our website under the loaner board tab. And you can register a board. And then in the spring, we send out life jackets to everybody who asks for them in the fall. Um, we get those out. Um, and it's a really great program. Uh, we have... Um, had saves in the past. Um, we actually just celebrated one of the first saves um, with Radar last year. Um, he was a young kid when it happened, and he's now a grown adult with kids of his own. Um, so cool. And so it's a really awesome program. Uh, those people who actually are out in the communities that do the sponsor are really kind of doing a lot of the work here with it, and they – do an amazing job of keeping track of the life jackets. They keep track of the boards. They take really good care of them. Um, there's a lot of people who aren't sponsors and don't really want to be sponsors, but they'll call me and be like, hey, did you know this board has no life jackets? Oh, okay. And so sometimes I'll be calling a sponsor. I'll be like, hey, did you know your, your board doesn't have a, any life jackets on it? And they're like, no, we didn't. We're supposed to go out next week and check it. We'll bring life jackets with us. So um, it's kind of like a really awesome community-style program, yeah. and it allows for those life jackets to get out there where people are going to be using them. Um, and – Places like on the Cuspaquim River, they travel oh. from board to board, just like on yes. the Kenai River. Oh, they travel yeah. from board to board. So a lot of these boards that are along riverways, some days they'll have way too many life jackets, and then the next day they'll have a few less. Skeleton because crew, yeah. <laughs> um, these life jackets travel from village to village, or they travel from like location to location all across Alaska, which is really cool. That's incredible, man. I never thought about... The river traffic that transpires in the summer with river communities and villages mm -hmm. and and the kids that are on these boats. There could be like a grandma with like five kids, like just cruising over to Auntie's house, you know, down the way and like, yep. damn, I didn't think about it. And then they just don't have a West Marine down the road in Nome to go get a yeah. life jacket, you so, know. And that's what uh, a lot of this program does is it uh, provides life jackets to areas where life jackets that's aren't cool. a super um, hot commodity and they... They take really good care of it. They're wow. um, really awesome out out in the rural Alaska where they use these life jackets for everyday travel. Yeah, um, there are people who wear them while they're snow machining on the rivers, which is crazy Whoa, to think of. That's but a like great that idea, happens. Right. Um, yeah, you're traveling it so much, right? Like yeah, there's overflow one of the, and things. Well, I you fall in and you break in, and your yeah. snow machine sinks in. 
I mean, at least you can stay stay floating. I can't remember which fire department it was, but it was a fire department in the North uh, North Slope Borough that was like, the, we have we leave some of them out in the wintertime for ice fishing and for snow machining. Yeah. So it's like um, these life jackets are getting a lot of use throughout the years, um, and it's just been really nice to see like kind of all of Alaska become like a very small like. We need life jackets community, which is really yeah. cool. We've yeah. definitely seen like the the community support where they've gra- grabbed hold of that I, multiple times. I've been on river launches or pullouts where people have been like, "I have too many life jackets in my <clears throat> my boat," and just hang them up there, and they're not even part of the program. Yeah, yeah. that was my question. Can people donate to you guys or directly just hang one up there? Yeah, absolutely. So. Like I said earlier, your life jacket does have to be in serviceable condition. Um, that's, you know, more important than you might think. Like a small little rip can become really quickly a, a very large rip that can make, you know, the flotation material can come out. Or if you can't buckle it all the way because the buckle's broken, it might not keep you safe in the ways it was designed to. So before you donate a life jacket, just check it for those things. Um, and then, yeah, you're definitely welcome. Anybody can put their, you know, old life jackets that don't fit their kids anymore or whatever straight onto a loaner board if you go buy one often yeah if you don't know where to take it you can bring it to us um we work in the Atwood building downtown or the rei in anchorage will take them and we okay. pick them up from there so you can donate into the program that way um and then same thing if you're gonna if you're gonna borrow a life jacket off a loaner board um a lot of times those are in pretty rough shape so just okay. check it over you know a damaged life jacket is better than no life jacket but just check it make sure it's the right size for whoever is going to be using yeah. it um, and check it over. And then I just also wanted to just add a little shout out to Alaska 529 this year, who's um, helped us purchase a huge amount of the life jackets that we purchased this year for the program. So that's a really cool new partnership. You'll see that we have these new um, decals for the boards. So they're going to, they look the same. They say kids don't float. They have the little stick kids on them, but it also says, uh, Use your PFD wisely. So mm. that's PFD oh, Alaska 529 and also oh, okay. personal cool. For the pick click, yeah. click give mm-hmm. for Alaska 529. Yeah. Nice. Um, my dad had a really good suggestion. Uh, we went to the Kenai rafting, the entire family, and I had brought every life vest I had. But we were missing an adult. And so I was like, well, let's go to the thing. And he's like, you know, they should have a kids don't float and then right next to it, adults don't either. And have like oh, some yeah. like some adult ones. Yes, that's a hashtag I use a lot. <laughs> hashtag <laughs> and kids so don't float. Hashtag adults, adults don't, float don't either. either. <laughs> so I was like, it'd be really cool to like add just have some of those. I mean, you can find them here and there. It's mostly kids. But what we ended up doing when we launched at um at Sportsman's, there was only kids ones. So I was, he's like, well, when you go to Jim's Landing. Um, see if there's an adult one there. And and like you said, a lot of times there might not be very many at this one, but you go to the end, especially if it's a busy day, a lot of people borrowed them and they go hang them up at the end. And he was exactly right. There was like three adult ones to choose from. Awesome. So I brought one back for him and he used it all day and put it right back up there. And it wasn't one of your guys. It was just like a random one that someone had left. So I don't know if you've noticed that the adult ones don't actually say kids don't float on them. They say wear it Alaska because um, we noticed that a lot of the adults weren't wearing the ones that were adult size and they say kids don't float on them. And um, someone said, like, I'm not going to wear it. It says kids don't float on it. And so um, Joe McCullough, who um, is the boating law administrator here in Alaska, he was like, if I change the wording on the adults one and just say wear it, uh, will you wear it? And (laughs) they said, yeah. So, um, the adults' life jackets now say wear it Alaska on them. <laughs> yeah. um, so that, to get people, like, adults to wear them as well. Um, and a lot of the times they would see the kids don't float um, on the bigger size life jackets and just assume they were larger size kids, but they're actually adult size life jackets. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was really, really cool. And, like I, I mean, you see them everywhere. You saw it, yeah. Yeah, that's really, really cool. Um, okay, I think we talked a lot about life jackets. <laughs> we, we went in depth. We went in we depth. We definitely went in depth in the life jackets. Yeah, I wanted to ask a little more about, like, life suits and Mustang suits. I, we don't have to go, like, another 30 minutes into it, but just – I know there's, like, classes or things you can do where you wear uh, those things. Like, what's the – I don't know. What's the long and short on like Mustang suits and, and how that whole like survival suit thing works. Um, so survival suits are, they're awesome. Um, if you have the time to put them on before, Mm. you know, the boat goes down, um, but you're not going to be walking around your boat in a survival suit. Um, so it's also another thing you should practice, um, Mm. putting it on, on the deck 
putting it on in water. Um, so those are kind of things to think about when you do those suits because they are a full body suit. They are hard to get on, especially if you and the suit are both wet and in the water. Yeah. Um, so practicing putting them those on um, kind of regularly would be a good idea. Uh, a lot of people, like a lot of um, larger boats have survival suits, um, especially if they're like commercial boats. We deal a lot with recreational boaters. A lot of recreational boaters don't use their survival suits. Um, they're using regular life jackets. But those survival suits, are they do help um, in cold, cold water. So um, they are kind of cool tool, but um, kind of your average – everyday Alaskan boater doesn't have a survival right. suit, but yeah. those who do, um, it is important to practice with them on. Um, but they're going to be kind of like your last minute, like this boat is going down. We're going to yep. be stuck here yep. for a while. That's always what I figured. Kind of thing. I mean, I have worn one before I, I actually did a, a hunt in Kodiak like five years ago. And <clears throat> one of the days we took a small skiff offshore and we went about 15, 20 miles up into some bays and did some stuff. And it was this glass and beautiful, but he would not allow us to get on that boat without those life suits it, just to get from A to B. You know, we were not walking around and hunting on them, but he made us put them on. So it was weird. I had to like gear up so that I could fit in, like, that. in that. Yeah. Like I got another dry bag with some more like gear, but I, I, it was just like, like you said to your, your point the practice like i'm yeah. like damn this was a pain in the ass to put on but when i was on in it and we were i was on the boat and we were cruising i was like man like this sucker flips i'm just gonna be like boop you know just kind of floating yeah and yeah they I, would definitely like extend your survival time in the water and one trick i've heard for getting on i don't I haven't tried this but is like putting like grocery bags like plastic bags on your feet and that helps them just to slide, slide in, in. Oh. if you're doing it kind of doing it in a hurry and during an emergency that okay that could help. i heard like oh, uh dawn too like soapy, like Dawn, like soap, and it'll slip in there too. You just got like a little packet of soap with this life suit, like, <laughs> get yeah, squirt and just, <laughs> yeah, that's what dudes were doing. I think I was scoot like I in mean, Hawaii, no and that's I'm what just, they would do. Uh, They'd put the soap in there. I don't know if it's just because it's multiple people putting their foot in there. Oh. <laughs> I've done that with diving wetsuits, but not with a survival suit. Okay. It probably would work the same way, but that yeah. wetsuit material works a lot better if you've got a little bit of Dawn soap on the gaskets. Yeah. Just kind of give it a little yeah. lubricant there. And, and I'll round it out. I, again, I don't want to like drag it out too long, but what's like a, a survival rate versus in the water street clothes versus I'm in the water dry suit or light mustang suit, life suit? I don't think I can really like put a put a number on that. Okay. There's so many factors that can affect how long you survive a person's in the water. age, the whole thing. But yeah. I would say, I mean, a life jacket, just a regular life jacket, mm -hmm. is your number one tool for increasing your chances of survival in cold water. Um, I think there's some studies I want to say from I want to say from the Coast Guard, but I could be wrong. That say like that could increase your chances by like fifty percent. Um, I believe that though. But and so with a survival suit, it would certainly be. I mean. As far as time spent in the water would be huge. I mean, yeah. if you could get one of those on, it would, it would give you a lot Hours more time. versus minutes, maybe? Sure, yeah. Yeah, and I, your answer is good because not 100% sure, but I always wondered, like, could it give me, like, two hours? Because if you made through a mayday, now you're in the water, and any given open waters is probably several hours between for the time for... Um, you know, whether it be troopers or Coast Guard, whoever can get to you the fastest, there's going to be at least a couple hours. I think like the Mustang think, right? suits are like kind of like 12 hours. Oh, you know, I'm like, sure. But know. I'm thinking like if it could just give you that, oh, like yeah. you, you 50%, right? You're, right. you're like your the, chances of. <clears throat> the, the crazy thing about the Mustang, if you Mustang suits something. though, are is like, you're usually using them in Alaska in not the summer, True. which means it's dark. So the, the events like that's going to occur like usually will be in the dark and when you're in a boat you usually don't have light so it seems like in the frankie brown the captain that we go out with in kodiak he won't let you on the boat unless you can put put one of those on in the dark with one hand wow. so wow it's like those are i think the skills that practice that we we're talking about earlier is you know what what are what's the scenario actually going to look like it's probably going to be dark it's going to be cold you're probably not going to have all your hands. You know, you got the one that sticks out after you get the hand in. So it's like practicing. Or the, or the that Dawn kind soap, of just chilling. The Dawn soap. <laughs> the bags yeah. are already in the I think that's footies. really good to think about because a lot of times, even if you're, if you are wanting to be safe on a boat and you know, oh, boating safety is important. A lot of times, I think 
even people with that mindset will get stuck on, oh, well, I've got, I've got this radio or I've, I've got my life jacket. And we just kind of stop at, oh, I have peace of mind now because I'm, I'm doing something. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, but you've got to really think of, think through different emergency situations and like, do you know how to use that device, that personal locator beacon or the radio? Do you know like how it's going to work or how long it's going to take? Or, Mm -hmm. you know, do you even know how to turn this thing on? Or a lot of times people will buy those inflatable life jackets that, and they don't always come armed with the cartridge, mm-hmm. and they don't even check. You know, they're just check. wearing they just, it for years, mm-hmm. and they never yeah, even had you know, a cartridge and in so it. So you got to <laughs> really like scary. learn. Well, I mean, learn I mean, it's your real though. There are people that yeah. just aren't thinking it through, right? Yeah, and and you have to. Uh, you yeah. got to run through scenarios. You have to yeah. think about the worst, plan for the worst. Obviously, that's not the plan to experience it, but to be ever be more prepared and. Yeah. And train for the worst. Practice. Practice. Yeah. yeah. And for people That's that are listening that this. maybe aren't aware or not from Alaska, we're talking a lot about Mustang suits. Um, Mustang suit is um, basically a full body, almost looks like if you were going to go scuba diving, but it already has the floats in it. So it almost looks like a really padded one piece, like old school ski bunny. It's a Gumby thing. suit, we call it. Gumby a Gumby suit. suit. Yep. Yes. There you go. Yep. And and these these are very popular for people that do crabbing, people that do a lot of cold water things out on the ocean. Um, I'm not sure if it's mandatory that uh, boats have these Mustang suits, um, but I know that a lot of the people that do the extreme Arctic Ocean things, like everyone has those Mustang suits on there. Um, so people that don't know what it is, that's kind of an explanation. I'm sure you could look it up on on uh, YouTube or on Google or whatever, the yeah, Mustang that's the suit. One. That's nice. And uh, basically it has a lot of reflection on it. It's something that you're going to put on in, in, in a safety situation, in a rescue situation um, where you're going to be in the water to flip boats flipped over or whatever. Um, and they're called, are they all, is Mustang a brand or is that just like the name mm-hmm. of the? That's a brand. So we would mm-hmm. call them either immersion suits or survival suits. Okay. Mm. I think Mustang is just <clears throat> just a brand I'm like the most familiar with, or you see the most in a store. Um, you had referenced those jackets earlier. Um, I bought a boat from a guy years ago, and he was like, "This is the only jacket you ever need to own." You know, every time you're on the boat, rain or shine, you wear this jacket. And I was like, "All right, man, I'll get one." And I'm like, "Oh man, I can't wear that like all the time, dude." The float coat. Yeah, yeah. I was like, "Man, it's G." Like he's going down the Yukon, and this is what you wear. And I'm like, that applies, but out on Finger Lake, ripping around with the kids, going swimming. You're going to over It's 80 <laughs> degrees. I'm out there with my orange jacket, like, good here. <laughs> yeah, we're all set, but you're not going to get that nice tan with that float No, coat. no. But <laughs> no, they get really warm when you're wearing Yeah. Them. I'm like, nah, man, I'm good. Um, well, speaking we'll keep, about we'll the Mustang going. suit and the falling in the water, um, obviously in a lot of cold weather places, hypothermia is probably the main um scare the main probably cause of death for people that fall in the water um drowning as well obviously what would you say is the relationship between like hypothermia and drowning yeah so i would say that's one of the main like the main misperceptions people have about cold water in alaska all have to do with hypothermia so people think um, number one they think that it happens really quickly if you're just to take a quick poll and ask people you know how long you think it takes after you fall into cold water before you're going to have hypothermia, they're going to guess low, like five minutes, 10 minutes. It takes Less than um, approximately 30 minutes before your core body temperature even starts to drop in cold water, even in like really cold water and even for kids. Um, so it takes a long time for that to happen. And because of what happens before that, that first two stages of cold water immersion, those are what's really going to, I mean, if you're going to pass away from falling into cold water, it's going to be one of those first two things, either the cold shock or the incapacitation, um, drowning kills long before hypothermia will. Okay. Mm. Um, you said uh, cold shock, and what was the other one you said? Incapacitation. So the first thing that happens you when you freeze up. fall into water yeah. is, is a cold shock, and so that's going to be your gas reflex. You're going to take this big breath in. You're going to start to hyperventilate. And your life jacket is incredibly important right in that second, even before you have to worry about getting back on your boat or swimming to shore just because it keeps your airway clear. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, you know, during that initial shock, they're going to inhale water from the gasping and stuff if your head's underwater. And so you're going to be panicking a bit. Um, And that doesn't normally last very long. It could be between one and three minutes or as little as 40 seconds, and that's going to wear off. And then within 10 minutes, you're going to start to experience the incapacitation where you – 
um, are getting that numbness. You know, we've all mm. experienced that mm-hmm. just, you know, in the cold. You know, it's hard to zip your coat or send that text. Your fingers start to get cold. It's going to um, start to affect your extremities, so your arms and legs. And a lot of people mistake that for hypothermia, but what that is really is your body trying to prevent hypothermia. <coughs> So okay. it's vasoconstriction, your blood vessels are shrinking, it's moving that warm blood back to your core to protect your vital oh, organs, nice. and so you've got less blood flow out to your arms and legs, they don't work as well, and that's really going to be your, your main concern. If you're not wearing a life jacket, even if you are the greatest swimmer of all time or really strong, it doesn't matter. If you can't properly use your arms and legs, you're not going to be able to keep your own head above the water. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I've had several situations where I've been with um, new rafters and new people and they've flipped on the Kenai, they've flipped in the water, they've hit a sweeper, they're not paying attention, um, boats flip, things happen, and they fall in the water and of course they have their life vest on and sometimes they're in the water for a long period of time until you can pull them out. What are some of the suggestions that you guys have as far as recovering someone before they reach that hypothermic stage like they just fell in the water they've been in the water for like five ten minutes and then you pull them out what are like five steps that you should do right away as far as warming them back up yeah or, yeah so i mean if you can if they haven't reached that stage of hypothermia then it's just a matter of getting them warm in whatever way you can so i mean if you if they can have a change of clothes that's going to be super helpful um things like that. The only time you've got to really worry about how you're maybe handling somebody or what you're doing for them post-rescue is if they've been in the water either an unknown amount of time, if you've just come upon them, or from, you know, long enough that they could be hypothermic. In that case, you can start, you know, to have all, you can get it really into the weeds on it, but they might be um, in danger if you just lift them out vertically. It's best to try to keep somebody horizontal, handle them really gently, because Once their blood has started to cool, if you're too rough with them, that can cause them to go into even cardiac arrest Mm -hmm. if that cold blood reaches back to their core. Shocks shocks the system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But as far as just, you know, someone, yeah, if they've fallen in, you saw them fall in, it's just been this quick situation. Just getting them out as soon as you can um, is the key there. And a change of clothes and all that stuff, too. And a lot Mm -hmm. of times, you know, you do have to think about that cold shock, um, our, our coworker Annie has a lot of has a good story about this. So she tells this story a lot about a girl at Jewel Lake. Well, we did a paddle fun day for the public, and so this girl was out in a kind of a really beautiful handmade native kayak, but it wasn't made for her, um, and so it didn't quite fit her hips correctly, and she didn't quite know how to use it. So she was out in Jewel Lake, not a huge lake, you know, but it was really windy. She wasn't able to. She didn't know how to turn it around, so she just keeps paddling straight. She eventually capsizes, and Annie goes out there to to try to help her out. And Annie knows enough to keep to keep this girl's kayak between between the two of them, just keeping that boat because the girl is freaking out. She's in cold shock. Grabbing and snatching. She's gonna grab Annie. She's gonna pull Annie in. And so, um, you know, Annie's trying to tell her what to do. Okay, you know, you know, can you do this? Can you do that? She's kind of stuck in the kayak, and that's really freaking her out. Um. And she keeps saying, you know, I can't, my arms aren't working, my arms aren't working. And all the while she's, you know, using her arms to like grab at things. And so you do have to keep that in mind either for yourself or for other people is that cold shock, you know, it doesn't last very long. And so sometimes it's even best to wait until that subsides before you start trying to make decisions or give people instructions. They might just, even if it's your best friend or your mom or your dad or whatever, like they might not be all there. So you're saying that little shock factor, like let them realize, hey, I'm actually swimming here mm-hmm. or floating, like relax Calm before down. you approach them yeah. so that they don't grab you and, and potentially and drown both of you. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Or for yourself, too. You know, when you fall in, the best thing to do is in that moment, try to just lay on your back um, let your life jacket float you. Try to get control of your breathing and get rid of that panic and shock because um, if you start, you know, flailing around and. And freaking out, you're going to lose a lot of your energy in those first few minutes. Mm -hmm. So let's say that someone um, is hypothermic. They've been in the water for 30 minutes or so, and and you come up on them and you you pull them out. Um, What are some of the steps? I mean, I've heard of, you know, skin to skin and and giving them (laughs) uh, warm liquids. Is that correct? So warm liquids could be good. I've heard that the best thing that you can give them is actually... Um, 
like calories. So, you know, if you have a cold like soda, that's even better than like if you or, you know, hot chocolate or whatever, something with Mm -hmm. calories to help them like rebuild that energy and and body heat. Um, But as far as a whole lot of other steps to that, I don't know that we can really speak on a lot of that. There's a lot of good trainings out there um, and videos. So if you head over to Alaska Boating Safety Program on YouTube, we have this series called uh, Boating Alaska, is it called? Um, And it's it's long and it's old, so just be prepared for uh, for how old it is. But it's really good information, and they'll get a lot more into the details on things like that. Okay. Um, There's this um, thermophysiologist named Gordon Giesbrecht who who studies this, I mean, for a living. And so he has this whole thing called cold water boot camp, and he'll get really into into the details on hypothermia. And he does a lot of trainings for, like, search and rescue and, and first responders on how to how to handle people and things like that. Okay. okay. From the cold water, cl- <coughs> cold water class that I did, it was kind of like the skin to skin is important, but, like, getting them calories is super important. Getting them in a dry bag that's warm that allows them to, like, retain the little heat they can develop is important. And then the same thing that Dana was talking about, they do a McKinley where they're boiling water and putting it in their sleeping bag with them, warm up some water and not to boiling, but just get it warm and throw it in there to help generate that heat. Yeah. That your body can't. Yeah, those right were away. like some of like the main like key items. Okay. Um, let's transition a little bit to, um, I know I was talking to you, Olivia, the other day at the stand um, about rescues and the throw rope thing. Um, like I said, I've been in several situations on, on different rivers where people have fell in. I fell in before one time. Um, I'll be honest. We were on the Gulcana last year. Um, Jack was there and I'm there with my brother and we are the last boat. Um, I am peeing on the back of the boat, just kneeling on the thing. And then we accidentally hit a, a rock and I just flip right into the water. You know, I'm not paying attention. He's he's in the front going, and we hit a turn, and I just flip right into the water. And, you know, uh, that shock is immediate, you know. Um, so the, the question I have is, is if I was able to stand up there and, and get myself out, but let's say if you're in a deeper water and someone is floating at, by you or you see someone floating by, how is the proper way to throw that throw rope? What is the proper way to throw the ro- throw rope? Um, so you actually want to throw it past them, like over their shoulder. Um, and then once it gets to them, you want them to grab a hold of it and you want them to put it on their ups- upriver shoulder because um, that's going to keep them kind of going the right direction. And it actually causes like a pendulum and brings them back to the side of the river. You actually don't want to throw a throw rope from the boat. The best way to do it actually is to get to shore. So you're bringing them into shore. Um, and that way you're not going to get accidentally pulled in. And um, you want to have constant communication with whoever you're throwing the rope to um, because they're in the water, they're cold, they're probably going to be panicking, um, giving them reassurance, like telling them, hey, we're going to get you this rope, um, grab a hold of it, put it over your shoulder. Um, If you miss the shoulder, fix it, like kind of like you want to talk it, uh, talk it through them, Um, talk to them, sorry words um so you want to talk to them the whole time it's going on so that they're aware of what's going on but also it's kind of helping you go through the process of like i need to get the rope to them i need to um secure the rope um you actually want to bring it around your back um so that it's kind of stabilized and if you have a secondary person they can hold on to your life jacket behind you and kind of like stabilize you as well um and it's just going to allow um for like a safer rescue that way um when you throw it, no, you're throwing it a little downstream in a fast water, right? Because uh, the, the heavier percent of life jacket's floating faster than the rope would. Yeah, I mean, if you can, I would say aim, like, straight. Just when they get right to you, Launch right it. to them. Yeah, don't try to think too much about upstream, downstream. Just, like, throw it right and as far past them as you can, just in case. And then I just wanted to add, you know, like, we've already been talking about, test out your equipment, practice, practice, yeah. practice the throw rope because oh we got a goodness. chance as a wow. we got a chance as a staff to do a training down in Hope earlier this summer. Um, and I, I grew up, my parents had a raft. We did the Kenai River every summer. Um, we've had a throw rope in the front of the raft my entire life. I've never had to throw it. And we did this training in Hope this year and practiced, and I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm terrible at this. I would never be able to rescue somebody. It's harder than it sounds. So what he had us do, our, our instructor, was 
practice throwing the throw rope, if you've got a throw bag, like on your boat, just without letting the rope out. Just throw it a few times to get a feel for the distance and the weight. And then when you're ready, like, let the rope out, and it kind of changes how it throws because the weight is changing. And so just practice that at a good distance, like 30 feet or You're whatever. throwing the bag. The bag. Yeah. Not well, you got to hold on to one end of the <laughs> yeah, rope. Yeah, definitely do that. And that's another thing is, you know, if you don't <laughs> think Chuck through. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. I forgot to grab the other side. Yeah, and there, Annie has a great story about that too. Somebody just picks it, yeah, throws it like a football, you know, but then you can't get them back. It's that doesn't float inherently on its own. Yes. It's not a, you know, flotation device. But anyway, just definitely if you've got equipment like that on your boat, it's great to have, but not so great if you haven't, if you don't know how to use it or haven't practiced it. So I have a carabiner on the other side that I carabiner into my boat in case I throw it. Is that a good idea to, to have? You could definitely do that. Um, it keeps your throw rope right where you know it, where it is. And if in an emergency you have to throw from your boat, um, it's then attached to your boat instead of to right. you. Okay. Um, there's also a lot of uh, places like um, we went through um, a training like Cosette said earlier in Hope, um, there's a lot of places in Alaska you can do these, like, um, kind of not simplified, but, like, easier courses to, like, find um, where you can, you know, do these training with ropes and with throw ropes and throw bags. And if you're going to be doing these fast-paced rivers, it's a really good idea to kind of invest in that small class. It might be a fee, um, but it's worth it if it, like, gets you used to throwing a throw bag to someone in a river because – you're going to practice that. Yeah. What's the class again? Um, we went through, I can't remember. So um, we went through the American Canoe Association, the ACA. So you, there are ACA certified instructors in the state. And then there's other places you can get like swift water rescue courses. We, there's um, connect canoers and kayakers out in the valley. Mm. Um, can't think of any other names right now. But it, um, on our start, website, alaskaboatingsafety.org, yeah. you can go to the courses tab and, and get a start on where to look. Sweet. But start rabbit holing in and finding all your resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, nice. Yeah. We're going to take a quick break right now and give a shout-out to some of our sponsors. Um, first, we want to give a shout-out to the Treehouse AK, uh, your one-stop dispensary located at 341 Boniface Parkway. Uh, be sure to ask the bud, bud tender over there about their deal of the day because, honestly, there's always something good on deck. Those guys are always having new products and new um, things for you guys to check out and new, more, new merch. Um, this is where the culture lives. At the Treehouse, their dedication to servicing consumers has been developed through a lifetime of involvement in the cannabis culture. They're committed to providing the highest quality products at whatever value your budget affords, while always maintaining the deep-rooted principles that have carried them this far. Their focus is on relationships over transactions, and you can always depend on them to treat you with the respect you deserve. Hit them up at thetreehouseak.com, and remember, you must be 21 years of age to enter their store. Serrano's Mexican Grill. Since 2008, Serrano's is Anchorage's own new generation of old, how do you, cocina? Cocina. Cocina. Their menu showcases the passion and love for the rich heritage and unique family recipe that have been passed down through generations. Serrano's goal is to embrace and display traditional flavors using the best ingredients that are available. They focus on making everything from scratch daily. In-house menu include handcrafted corn tortillas, serrano uh, salsas, carne asada. The carne asada is bomb, dude. Lunch the other day was so good, good, dude. Uh, marinades and chorizo, uh, but don't take their word for it. Experience the tradition and savor it for yourself. Uh, locations on Tudor and Northern Lights. See the tequila bar. Uh, Jack, you always talk about some smoked tequila or something. The mescalitas. Yeah, oh, mescalita. Yeah. So good. Yeah, yeah well, I mean. About do, man. Yeah. yeah. Check out their day specials at uh, serranosmexicangrill.com. Um, finally made it over there this week, man. That's no joke. It's nice. That place, place is so really beautiful. I was blown away the second I walked in. I was like, whoa. Like, he didn't pull out all the stops, full when the modern thing, when you say, why when you walk in, it's like, wow, this is yeah. not like the Mexican joint you're used to going into and hearing the music. And it was there, but it just didn't have that. All Alaska wood. It's, oh, man. It's really craft. I was yep. unbelievably impressed. And then the staff was great. The place was packed. I was like, damn, this has a good vibe in the whole night. The merchandise display behind the bar, I was like, 
Man, there's like no, cool. no Mexican joint I've ever seen. I loved it, man. Yeah, it's it was very awesome. nice, very high end, but the prices are you yeah, know low, it, it just as like you'd that. expect. Yeah. The food is delicious. The specials are awesome. And I just spoke to Josh literally a couple hours ago. Nice. Um, they're about to. They're spot on tutor. They're about to put the bar over there. Nice. Um, they're about to the redo that whole place, kind of similar to what they do on Northern Lights. Um, so the people that are on the east side can enjoy that place over there. It's going to be really, really Good. nice. Yeah, um, so. You know, there's a lot of other Mexican food options, but, you know, Serrano's is one of our sponsors. So, you know, go check them out, support them. They support us and just keep it rolling. Yeah, yeah it's delicious. It's really authentic. Tailored Restoration, 24-hour emergency home services, helping Alaskans restore their dreams since 1972. Services include fire, water, mold, post-emergency cleaning, repair and remodeling, including burst pipes, overflowing toilets, down trees, fires, pet accidents, and vandalism, and way more. Taylor has an emergency response number with trained professionals available to help you at any time, day, or night. Give them a call in Anchorage, Eagle River, Matsu, or Fairbanks. Hit them up at tailoredrestorationalaska.com. You guys know about uh, <clears throat> the water damage I had in my condo over on the um, east side in Peck, and Taylor just stepped it up. They came right out, right away to you know, go and dry the place out, and then the steps they took to make sure that they maximized like my insurance and give me a fair deal, but also got in there and did a really good job. Um, they're a killer. You should hit them up. Yep. And a quick shout-out to some of the other sponsors. Uh, you know, Angelique over there at Menegato's Accounting, um, she's doing a lot of cool accounting services for businesses and for local people. Definitely check out Um She's doing awesome things. Lawn Pro AK. As winter approaches or you're tired of mowing the lawn, LawnProAK.com. Um, they'll come take care of it. I mean, they did my parents' property for years as they are now snowbirds and they got their home here and their home in Columbia. Um, so they take care of it all, man. They do the lawn. They, they shovel. Um, they bring the gravel. They scrape up the gravel you know at the end of the year mm -hmm. um so if you are looking for someone to do your yard professionally and you don't got to think about it lawn pro ak definitely.com uh double shovel you know one of our main sponsors they're always got a lot of cool stuff brewing the grapefruit lavenders out right now which is delicious um they got a lot of cool events going on all the time i know katie's got a lot of things going with them basically any cool big events double shovels double shovels there uh, AKO Farms, um, they're constantly putting out new product. They're at the treehouse. They're at, I want to say he said he's at the Green Jar um, out in Wasilla as well. Um, located out in Sitka. Shout out to those guys for definitely supporting us. And we, we're always talking about the Bait Shack and Dustin down there um, doing their thing. And Anchor Town Dogs, we're still singing the dogs. We are right so outside of Atwood um, and on 4th Avenue. The season is coming to a close. We will be closing probably mid-August there as hunting time comes. Thank you. Um, so get it while you can because it's uh, – unfortunately, the summer is, like, flying. Dude. And it's already, like, almost August. I mean, we just did the fall roundup, and it's just, it's just flying. Oh, it's insane how fast it's going, man. It's almost scary. Like, every summer just – speeds up doesn't it yeah the rat race is faster the hustle and bustle the what do we call it the running gun the running gun the running exactly gun exactly it's like just sums it all up it's just like every day you have like something going on and if you don't have something going on all of a sudden you have something going on because someone called you or something you know and it's like oh, I, got, I got time for that and it's like yeah. you can't luck, say man. no it's <laughs> like a missed and opportunity exactly. that you can't make up <sighs> yeah, dude, it's it hotter than hell in the studio tonight, bro. Yeah, it's hot in here. And even though I, it was I wouldn't use the there. restroom and come back, I was like, oh my god, yeah, there's it's a sauna crazy. up in here, man. You guys are doing good. You're just like chilling, but <laughs> it's starting to set in, fan. though, huh? Yeah, it's yeah. getting hot. It's humid, man. The new it's studio is going to be nice and cool. We were here. back checking it out earlier, and we got some paint up, and it's coming along. And uh, we're like, damn, dude, it's like 65 in here. Yeah, like that's what's up, man. That's going to be nice. Um, nice. Well, let's uh, let's jump into some trivia here, Jack. Before we get to more uh, questions with um, hey. with Cosette and with uh, Olivia here, um, so you know we kind of came up with a little something. We've been we've been talking about this, and maybe we can uh, do a little intro. Who's to been the talk and talking? Well, about we were what? talking about it. Tangy was talking about it. Remember with Tangy, we were talking about coming up with a jingle. Oh or, yeah, yeah, the jingle. So we just yeah, kind of been looking. Right, just some kind it. of funny we've been talking about. <laughs> 
Trivia time. Trivia with Jack Lau. <laughs> <laughs> it's a rough draft, bro. It's a rough draft. <laughs> All right, Jackie. Hit All us right. with the question, bud. Yeah. So we have voter safety, so we're going to keep it topic, uh, you know, <laughs> specific. So, so the, distracting. The, 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 the girls can jump in if you guys are too far off. Yeah. Are we well, going to play that in the background the whole time? No, we could turn it well, fades was, out. I mean, that was the out. plan, but right. like, no, can you concentrate? Yeah. Well, I can. It's I, just, I don't know I if someone wants to listen to that. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Get your game show face on, just get it going or what? So here we have Daniel Batrago. <laughs> hey, Daniel, where are you from? Oh, well, Anchorage, Alaska. <laughs> and Brandon, know? what is your favorite hobby? Oh, man. I love the outdoors. <laughs> Woo! Trying on life. Vests. Really? I would never believe it. <laughs> Kids float. <laughs> All right. I guess they don't float. Kids but don't float. They float yeah. now. They float we, with we the life the, jacket the, on the right. when it's properly fitted and the right size and application. <laughs> you goddamn right it fits. Yeah. And it does Proper, work. Properly float. inspected. <laughs> All right. So in 2020, how many uh, boating fatalities did we have in Alaska? Damn, just full dark. Just Man, just 2020 right boater I'd fatalities. I'd say full real. For real. In all of Alaska, in 2020 boater fatalities, I am going to say 19. Hmm. And that's high, too, I think. I don't know. I say 19. Mm. And when you think about how many human beings frequent the water, whether it be, you know, fresh salt, river, stream, creek, pond, pool, I mean, ice, all of it. Snow machining. Snow machining, ice fishing, dog sledding. I mean, just all the, the stuff that requires waterway passage well so this would be recreational boating fatalities oh yeah right? good point or okay. i don't know oh. it's all boating fatalities in the boating. state of alaska boating. So which like would not include like snow machines yeah everything oh. included. all boating i'm still gonna stick with 19 now you don't know the answer right you guys don't get these facts in the memo on I mean, monday i know the answer for recreational boating because that's what we deal with at our oh office. you do okay oh. so you don't so you don't okay. get to answer that, then maybe. that's okay yeah, maybe. We'll Damn see. it, I don't. I don't know. Well, we have we have to get we have to get other guests involved here. So okay, so uh, Olivia, the question is: In 2020, how many? And um, you can't answer it yet. Trivia. Th- we're doing a trivia right now. You should um, you should throw her the the jingle real okay. quick. Just to start okay. over. Right. Just she for wants fun. the jingle. Just to, just to make sure she's on. I was talking the full <laughs> intro, dude. Do the full. The Jack oh, La- I want to hear it one more time. Go ahead. Just let it, let it rip. One more time with one the full time. intro. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I got to turn the volume off if you want to work. Trivia time. <laughs> no, it's mixed. Trivia with Jack oh. Lau. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We're, we're working silly. on that. We're working on it that. Was right? It was good. It was good. It was good. I liked good it. It was supper. totally just like we did one thing and yeah. took. Ten seconds, right? I it's literally good. came here an hour early to like try to figure yeah. it out, and that's what we came up with. Yeah. In like the last three yeah. minutes, <laughs> right before the girls showed up, I'm like yeah, that's yeah, the that's one. it, that's it. Let's get it. Let's is get that where you were doing when you're trying to be on MTV Spring to Break? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was it. Yeah. <laughs> Drink your beer and doing 15 seconds worth of work. <laughs> yeah. that's exactly, exactly. <laughs> All right, yeah. So the question, which you can't answer until these guys answer, um, and you guys can team answer whatever you want to do there. Um, is in 2020, how many boating um, fatalities do we have in Alaska? And Jack's question is boating, recreational, professional, commercial? All of it. All of it. It would be whatever was reported by the Alaska uh, 13. statistics 13. on 13. boating safety. Right, you say 13, 13, I said 19. Olivia? Or go ahead, Cosette's got the mic there. You already said, you guys already have a jump start, so... so. On, on the com- I'm on guessing the if it's all boating fatalities, I guess I would, I would guess maybe thirty-five. What? Thirty-five? Okay. All right. Mm. Hold on. Let's see. Let's what see. What was the other number? Like if I, it was recreational. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on. Let her, let her, let her guess. I'd let probably say it's closer to thirty-nine. Okay. Thirty-five, oh, thirty-nine. Okay. Well, I'm, I might okay. have messed something up here. What? What, what would be the number if it was recreational? Yep. Twenty-six. Oh, okay. As far as I know. Okay, so I got the number off the Alaska uh, Boating Safety Statistics website, and it was number it was twenty four. Okay, so that, that would that be recreation be, that, only. That could be it. Recreational yeah. boating, so not co- not counting commercial. Oh, okay, yeah. mm. all right. So it wasn't counting commercial. So you don't like, really have a legit answer to the question. Well, 
I or, do I have mean, an answer. Yeah. It's just, just it's not commercial. Yeah. yeah. So it's recreational, like if it was us, I guess. Well, so your I, question, which was is like weird though, because it. it didn't specify that on like the briefing. It was well, an actual briefing, like mm-hmm. a le- official letter document, yeah. like, "Hey, this is the official statistics for the state of Alaska in boating fatalities." But your guys, your state yeah. rec, so you're not like regular uh, part of any regulation with commercial side of things, right? Yeah. Right. We so deal strictly different. with recreational boating safety, and we don't. We're not law enforcement or anything. Yeah. Like Commer- that. Commercial is like s- Coast Guard standard, um, and then there must be another report or statistic or some information available. I would think on the commercial what, what, side of things. What was the answer? Twenty six. Twenty four. So who won? That was a really high year. You won. What you say? Yeah, yeah, it was. So that, that, but don't don't jump in on that yet. But you can explain that on the next question. Because the next question has part two, which is exactly related to that. Oh, perfect. (laughs) All right. So uh, nationwide, including commercial stuff, because it's a Coast Guard number this time, um, how many in 2020, how many fatalities do we have nationwide? And that's next level. I'm going to say 112. You need the music to think? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> we should get the music Jack back on. I kind of like it. <laughs> Just to get it. Trivia time. Oops, I didn't miss. I'm learning the buttons here. There we go. <laughs> All right, Brandon, you're on. You're under the gun here. Uh, I'm going to go with 237. 237, I said 112. I think that's way low, man. That's got to be yeah. like crazy low. Yeah, you're saying low? the whole nation, including commercial. Yeah. I mean, I oh, feel like. Oh, shit, thousands. thousands. Yeah, I, I want to say like 600. 600? Like, yeah. What do you say, Olivia? Definitely like six or 700. No, we need an exact number. <laughs> All right. This is let's trivia. See, like let's get a little closer to the mic so everyone oh, can hear you. 674. You're damn close. It was 767. Wow. wow. Well, if you and think about... Oh, go ahead. No, go for it. No, I was going to say like per capita, like we probably have a high amount for, you know, minimal population and then the frequent boat. Just boaters people, because yeah. of Alaska and we're just surrounded by water and we all use and the water for, outside a lot. But yeah. then you got like the, the folks from Iowa, I'm sure they have a lake or something that they go frequent or a creek or something and things happen. Unfortunately, I'm sure there's some crazy stories and circumstances where they're just, you know, human negligence that create situations. But I would just think there are people that live in areas where they're like, they get on a boat maybe once a year for an hour and their, you know, exposure to water is so low that, there's the like Nebraska, yeah, the where Nebraska's they're just, and you know, but over in Chesapeake Bay, there's like you know, or Virginia, or Florida, or Texas, you know, yeah. what I mean, it just uh-huh. it's like it blows up. But what, what was the seven, number again? Seven sixty seven. That's crazy. That's yeah, a lot. That's what would that lot. be divided by twenty or fifty, 50. states? So it'd be like what twenty something. So we're pretty average, but we have a lower population density. Now, do all the That's states have a similar kids don't float deal? Is that nationwide or yeah, is that Alaska? Thirty thing? is the average per state. Definitely not all the states, but there are similar programs in some states. Pe- we get re- people reach out to us on I would say almost fairly regular basis asking about starting it there yeah uh, how mm. can we start that or can they use our you know branding and stuff for their yeah. loaner board program and so that's it's pretty out there cool. that's yeah, awesome. i'm sure you that's guys cool are totally good with sharing all and everything you can to help them right if you travel to a different state you can um go on to like any like the state government website and like type in like boating safety or like google like the state like california's boating safety program and a lot of the times they'll have information about like loaner boards and stuff like that and they'll tell you where they are mm. or um kind of like what counties participate in the program mm-hmm. and stuff like that um so a lot of those programs you can find them um so if you're visiting and you're like hey we're gonna be on this lake i don't really want to buy a life jacket for like the one week we're here is there a loaner board program kind of thing that's way That's cool. Really There's cool. also like agencies like the CETO Foundation or mm. Boat US Foundation, I think, that do nationwide yep. loaner programs that aren't like state related. I wonder if it gets state specific. I wonder like Hawaii. They probably have a lot. There's a lot of crazy surfing and things that are going on out Man, there. Dude. Yeah. If Again, you're interested in water. digging into kind of those, if you like those numbers and the statistics, um, if you go to the, so this is. A fun acronym, but National Association of Boating Law Administrators. So that's NASBLA, NASBLA NASBLA.org. I got N-A-O-B-L. What did I miss? It's National Association of Boating Law Administrators. NABLA. NASBLA. 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 
state voting law administrators. There we go. The That's what I'm missing. There, right? I just got the state voting law administrators. I saw our state and like school really districts. They love acronyms. If you go to their website, they have um they have some a whole ton of dashboards, so you can look at these statistics or click on you know they you can click through different states and find all kinds of interesting numbers and um, all of that. Okay, don't go to that um, website for the rest of the trivia, please. Yep. Yeah, yeah, don't go yet. <laughs> yeah, tell okay, me okay, that. yeah, no, good point. Good I catch. I actually yep. checked. I'm like, let's start Googling it. <laughs> okay, so part, so we have one more question after part B of this question. But Trivia. what, so we said 767, and we also said 24 for Alaska for fatalities. What percentage increase was that due to COVID, basically, oh people my getting goodness. out from 2019? Great question. This is really interesting in the. It's got to be research. a huge spike, dude. It's got to be a huge spike because everybody and their mother went to Walmart and bought a life jacket and, and a Seahawk. And I was like, I got the day off. All, all the power boards are sold out for yeah. two years. I'm going like, to say yeah. double. So I'm going to say 349. Oh, this is a nation uh, percent. The, wait, the year was before. The, the, the increase was the same for the, uh, the state of Alaska as it was nationwide. Wow. In my research, and, and the, yours, uh, what was the question again? The percentage increase, increase in fatalities in 2020 versus 2019. 87. Uh, 87 percent. Okay, I said that's cool. Man? You're saying 50. How about you how guys? Aren't, you, you guys aren't like gasping at me like oh, what? It must be close. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think. I I can't remember the numbers of 2019, but I do remember that was a very low year, mm. and 2020 was a high year. So yeah, I think. I would say, yeah, around 80% would be my guess. Yeah. 80%. Probably. Nice. Olivia? Probably like 60 or 70. Okay, conservative. It was there's a, still quite a few boaters that like went out in 2019. I know it was a lot lower, but. It was a 25% increase, which I think is oh. huge. Oh. Wow. You know, yeah. like. Just like, duh. We were like, was like over. Over. Yeah, yeah. 100%. <laughs> I, I think I kind of sold it no. big with saying like, because of COVID or whatever. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I mean, 25% me increase. Really I, was like, yeah. a big increase. I was like, I need to go full extreme on this to be the guy yeah. that was just dumb and right. I mean, it's and like. I was way <laughs> off. Like I always am. It's Same. like 125 but, you know, more people nationwide. That's a lot when yeah. you're talking about yeah. 767. Yeah. So. That's. I thought that was. That, you know. Okay, so do you think the increase in actual people using the water and life jackets was 87%, where it, like, doubled almost? But the fatalities wouldn't be the same. Like, mm. like if there are well, a so thousand more people, people... More people being on the water also can just make the waterways more dangerous, especially if they're yeah. all, you know, new, and don't know regulations, don't know laws, don't Very know true. safety. Very true, yeah. Yeah, let's jump right into that as she says that because you asked me mm. earlier before we started the podcast and everyone showed up. Um, you mentioned you said anyone can just go and buy. Oh man, this kills me, dude. Go this buy, you know, some hundred and fifty thousand dollar boat, sixty thousand dollar huge craft, or whatever. It's thirty feet long and ten thousand pounds. You know, and just roll up and buy it from wherever and then go to Whittier or Seward or wherever and just go on the water. You don't need a license. You don't need or a raft. You don't need anything, anything. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's kind of insane. I've I've always found it just like, there's so many people that don't even know how to back a damn boat down in the ramp. Let alone, yeah, and or or remember to put or remember to put their damn plugs in. And so they don't fly. I mean, I've just seen, I've been the guy. Number one, been doing it a long time since I was a teenager. Actually, my parents were kind of cut me loose, and I went and did my own thing. And I, I, I learned the hard way a few times. Thankfully, no one got hurt. Um, but what I've witnessed over the years is is boating in Alaska. I frequent the water all the time. I'm twice twice a month at least for five to six months of the year um, on a boat and. Uh, it blows me away, as Daniel mentioned before, and I've been saying this for years, like, how is it that you have to have a driver's license to drive a car, but then you don't have to mm-hmm. have any credentials to go buy a 30,000 or a 30-foot boat that's incredibly dangerous, endangering, potentially endangering the lives of its occupants, and there's just like there's no certification, licensing, or anything required to just throw that sucker in and go for it. Yeah, it's you pretty know? interesting. And so that website I mentioned, mm-hmm. um, they 
one of their dashboards they have is the education das- dashboard, and you can look at which states require education mm. and which don't, and, you know, different, you know, at what age and different things. And Alaska is one of the only states that doesn't have any required education for Yeah, voters. the last frontier. <laughs> <laughs> Let's yep. get after it. Yeah, I'm not sure we can be proud of that one. <laughs> well, I'm oh, so there is. In some yeah. of the other states, you might have to have most, some sort of a license or a permit mm-hmm. or pass a test. To me, you it's would like have to take a, cl- um, a boating safety class. And so in Alaska, if you take a NASBLA approved course, so we, we offer one or there's several you can take online. If you take that course, typically it will transfer. So if you were to like move or you go visit down in, you know, like a hunter's Washington education, like a hunter's mm-hmm. education yeah. certificate. Yeah. You, it, it would count down there, or you know, even in Alaska, it'll at least if you have that card, it'll typically get you a discount on boat insurance and things like that. that so there's some cool. small wow. incentives for yeah. Yeah. for doing it, but most of the time, it's just relying on some you know Alaskan boater wanting that education on boating safety and taking the step to, to get the class, which. Yeah, it's and knowing it exists. Yes, and so like, it's it's quite a challenge. For me, I mean, we go out in the boat all the time, and I have a laminated checklist that I've basically developed by talking to other people that have been spending, you know, 20 or 30 years out there doing things. And it has a checklist that's everything before I launch. So it includes your pl- the plugs, which it's pretty important. Pretty let's, let's elaborate thing. on that. That's but, on my little thing is but, safety checklist. But it but it also goes to there's a whole section on like people that are jumping on my boat, what they need to do to be able to save their life and mine. So it's like mm. understanding where's like, the fire extinguisher, where's the yeah, and how to how to use the radio, what what channel it should be on, where's the spare radio, how do you get it, does it sink or not? You know all these things. Um, and so do you guys offer a checklist like that, like a marine or, or river checklist specific yeah, to what you're doing? Yeah, we have a pre-departure checklist. So we've got it right here in the Alaska Boaters Handbook, but we also have it separate on our website. So if you go to publications there on the right, um, on that little... And this is dnr.alaska.gov slash parks <laughs> If you just go to alaskaboatingsafety.org, it'll take you okay. here. Yeah, it's kind of a long... Uh, it's yeah. a state w- parks w- thing, w- so w- it's One, two, three, four, PDF slash... But under publications, slash. there's a... should be in here, pre-departure checklist. Um, hopefully. Yeah, Yep, pre-departure checklist under checklists and float plans. Yep, um, float plan. And so we also even offer that as like a sticker if you want to like get a sticker of oh, it, stick cool. it on your boat. Oh, that's and cool. Laminate it and just have it on there. Yep, but I think it's great to, de- to develop your own, like take ours as a starting point, right. but everyone kind of has their own, you know, things that they do. And so yeah. there's things you want to do before you leave the house. There's things you want to do before you launch, yep. you know, or before, you know, all kinds of things. So, and some of these things have to be done, you know, once at the start of the season. Some of them have to be done every single time you're going out. Right. So it's good to make your own um, just so that you can make it specific to your boat type and your equipment. And then you mentioned like a passenger briefing, and I yep. think that's huge. Um, yep. Really, really important that you're making sure anyone who gets on your boat knows the location of all the gear. And then also just from the point of view of a passenger, if you're going out on somebody's boat – don't just rely on them knowing or doing everything that right. they're supposed to be doing. Ask those questions that, you know, make sure you're taking that safety into your own hands and that you know where's the radio, how do you use it, where the flares kept, or, you know, what to do in an emergency um, because it could be the operator of the boat that right. falls overboard or has a heart attack or something crazy, and you got to know that yep. stuff. And mm-hmm. I found that. Like, I think that it starts – it's a conversation starter for sure. And what I realized right away is that the most of the people that are coming on the boat would not be able to save my life, which is really key, you know, like, okay, well, if the captain's gone, who's going to save everyone else? They got to yeah. be able to save me first. Mm-hmm. And it, it just was eye opening on, on just how you, you expect people that grew up here doing this stuff to have like certain skills. And then they get on there and there's these gaps and there you don't know what 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 gaps they actually have but it helps discover those gaps and it's a verification process that everyone's in the same page yeah we recently got to um be involved in the kenai river guide academy this year which normally wouldn't at all be something that we do because we just do recreational boating but um that was a big part of you know training for new guides too is talking about you know 
getting an idea of your passengers, like what do they know and their experience level and even like medical conditions, you know, maybe that's something they don't always share with people, right. but you should probably know if they're going to be out on your boat and something were to happen, you know, are they on a medication and that kind of thing is important too. That's a pretty thorough checklist. It's over 30 um, things. That's just a pre-departure checklist. Um, that's so cool that you could print that out and get a sticker and put on your boat. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and to your, <clears throat> to yours, I mean, if something happens to the captain, someone's got to know yep. what to do. Yep. You know, at least one or two people, if you have, you know, multiple six packs or four people, one person, at least one person for sure. Like I always like to pride myself as like a first mate any yeah. on any boat. I go on with anybody that's like, Hey, come on my boat. I'm like, Hey, I feel like, I could throw down on whatever situation. I, I'm your guy, but I may not necessarily know your vessel, mm -hmm. where your stuff is. I mean, never go through that checklist. I can tell you that. Yeah. I mean, and I, I do have all the stuff, and I've done the checklist, and I have the all the requirements, and I know exactly where they are. But to actually physically go over them with all your passengers and occupants, probably be a good idea <clears throat> as far as throw cushions life jackets and some of the well, really, especially really, really immediate new, stuff yeah a new person on your boat mm -hmm. i mean i'm sure your kids have heard it oh well, i mean but it's yeah, it's they're, that they're repetitive it, like hey if this happens do it yeah, if this happens yeah. you know yeah. just that safety is important it's and like you guys said it earlier when we, when we first started the podcast it's one of those things that you want to embed where it's like automatic you're not thinking about safety it's just yep. like oh you just there put on is. this you just put on the life jacket it's just what you have to have on you know you're gonna go ride your bike you put your helmet on you don't even think about it anymore you put your yeah. seatbelt on as soon as you go in the car so these type of things should be just natural instilled in instinct you. instinctive things that just happen that you're like just already doing it you're not like oh let's check the checklist it just should be like yep you're doing this every single time so that anyone that boards on your boat just knows we're going to go through these things. Yeah. So Thanks. I do have one more trivia question. Oh, so right that was part, part B, that last <laughs> oh, one. Shit. So I thought this one is really important for Alaska. Um, and I think it's probably equally important. <laughs> but um, what percentage, so we said 767 uh, nationwide for fatalities, Which per what percentage or number, um, <clears throat> let's go by percentage, uh, were uh, deaths, with a leading contributor being alcohol 50 percent nationwide, nationwide. so 767 and then uh no, but yeah um, so we're going percentage i'm gonna say 42 oh i was gonna say i'm 39 39 percent it's Fif probably more 51 there you go i'm gonna go with 60 oh wow that's probably realistic well so it so it was it's 18 percent uh so 100 100 deaths Wow. Yeah. Actually, okay. I put my. I think I was thinking I of it. That's contributing factor in accidents. Maybe that's about yeah, 50. Yeah, I think that might have but been. But fatalities, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so what was a percentage that contributed to accidents again? What I think it? that's close to. It's. I think that's more of an estimated statistic. Is close to fifty percent. Yeah, and mm -hmm. that makes Nationwide. sense though. Yeah. yeah. And in Alaska, it's. I don't know if you. We're gonna go into that. No, but, I don't. Um. So for in Alaska, alcohol is a known contributing factor in at least 37 so about over a third of alaska's boating fatalities over the last 30 years mm -hmm. and then it's un unknown whether or not alcohol was involved in like another 30 percent. so it's likely a lot higher than that 37 right yeah well i can be honest 100 percent of the people that i've seen flip their raft it was all alcohol related mm -hmm. yeah and and that's reported Right. But again, fatalities typically get reported. And those yeah. are fatalities, Acc the ones that I... Okay, but yeah. accidents don't always get reported. No. Okay, so if we're yeah. talking like percentage of boat accidents reported, yeah, that's... Or let's talk percentages on that. Of actual <laughs> accidents that get reported, what, maybe 15%, yeah. 20%? Yes. Come on, people aren't yeah. going to report stuff if they don't have to. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm just being real here. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's yeah. you know, it's human nature. Yeah. And you got to wonder. And and it's, uh, I saw it on the Instagram. It's a leave it for sure. Or wait, wait for yeah, sure. Yeah, so what that was, that? I, uh, I'm glad you, this came up. Um, yeah, let me find that. That was again. a new thing we just started this year. 
for Fourth of July weekend was a campaign called Save It for the Shore. Mm -hmm. Um, And so nationwide, the campaign that typically happens over Fourth of July weekend is called Operation Dry Water, and it's more of a law enforcement thing. It's like a big push in law enforcement to catch people. Um, And we've never really done that because we aren't a law enforcement agency, you know, but we've supported it. But this year we just thought, you know, a lot of times it's, you know, looking at the just following a lot of local breweries and places on Instagram last summer and this summer, I just noticed a lot of times they're posting pictures of people out boating and drinking. And so we thought, you know, nobody follows Alaska boating safety program, but everybody follows, you know, yeah. King street or whatever. So we needed them to be the ones to put out this message. And so we put it out mm. there and it started pretty small this year, but we were really excited about how it went. We're hoping it gets bigger, but the idea is, you know, it's not, you know, Operation Dry Water implies, you know, don't drink, don't, no alcohol at all. And it's like, we know people are going to be out enjoying their Alaskan adventure, their great weekend, you know, that's great, but you support your local breweries that you like, take it with you, but just save it for when you're safely back on shore. Because research shows that if anybody on board is drinking, the risk goes up for everybody. So a lot of times, you know, some states do like a sober skipper kind of campaign, and that's great too, but really, if anybody, even if you're a passenger, it's really not safe, both for the people on board, but also for yourself. You know, you're not, you're more likely to fall in because you've got, you know, your judgment, vision, balance, all those things. So you're more likely to go in the water or have an accident. Um, And then alcohol is a vasodilator. So that incapacitation we talked about earlier, you're really taking away your body's only defense against the cold water if you've been drinking. And so you're survival time in the water is significantly reduced also because your blood's already thinner like you've already you've already diluted your blood right Mm -hmm. you you, it doesn't have it doesn't flow the same i mean and it's just running right closer to the surface of your skin so it's going to cool so much faster gotcha gotcha it doesn't allow those capillaries to shrink um, so it keeps mm. them open the whole time. So instead mm. of your body protecting itself, it actually like just lets it flow. Yeah. Vasodilator. Yeah. That's the why heat you just think, goes out. That's I've why you think that. you're staying warmer. Right. You when feel you're flushed cold. when you you know oh, you feel warm okay. because it's like right up the surface of your Got skin. Got it. Got it. Pushing so, it off. And so that's another you know when you're talking about what should you do if someone's been hypothermic? Because sometimes people think like oh, oh give yeah. them this like whiskey or something because that you know they have this idea they know people know that that warms you up but it's really just it's like a false sense of warmth right yeah Yeah, i thought this campaign was awesome yeah Uh, yeah we would um, i was glancing at it and i'm like yeah double shovels to get on board with that yeah for the shore more than happy to uh help out um next yeah we were really excited so we got yeah broken tooth did it um two seasons metery in anchorage and then uh up in fairbanks still at 65 um and so it's nice. yeah, small this year, but we're hoping it gets bigger. Oh, it and, will. Um, yeah. And just getting that message out, because even this year, over 4th of July weekend, there was a fatality out in Big Lake. 21-year-old fell off the back of the boat. He wasn't the operator. The mm. operator of the boat was a 16-year-old. He was sober. But, yep. you know, that just goes to show if you, even if no you're No one was ready for that. No one was ready for it. Right. What happened in that situation? He fell off the back of the boat around 4 in the morning. Mm, just late um, night riding, and having fun. I think it took him did they f- a did long they, time. Did they I think find they him? Did. did they find him? That's so sad. But it took a long time for him to, yeah. to locate him. Okay. Well, even at that time in the middle of that lake, I mean, yeah. it's cold. Yep. And oh, the man. energy you're going to expend to try to get to shore, you know, you might not make it. I got like a reminder of the cold reality check of cold water. Um, South Raleigh, we were out. You guys swam in it Sunday, right? Oh, yeah. When they're playing around. Oh, yeah. The first, like, four feet have pockets of, like, nice warm water. Dude, there's some cold but if spots. But if your foot is hanging down, like, the, from the Dean down, I mean, you can feel it's... You're talking, like, a 10-degree swing. I mean, that might be extreme, guys, but it's cold. Like, you can feel, it, like, whoa. Like, it's... You know, that, that sun has only warmed that little chunk of the water and yeah there's a temperature gradient and that's a lake that's only like 18 20 foot deep and it gets warm but there are lakes and drainages and areas that are just they're running 40 degrees 45 degrees all year and doesn't matter there is no warming it up and man yeah cold water is is there a technique you could practice to avoid that cold water gasp so i think from what I've heard, if, if you're someone who goes in the cold water a lot, you know, mm. and you swim in it a lot and you've grown up here and you're really used to it, you can kind of become habituated. Or a diver, um, like where you're just... 
Yeah, and so that yeah. can make a difference versus someone who's just come up here for the first time and they're used to warm water. Um, but the main thing would be speed of immersion. So if if somehow you can control that you're going to mm, get in slowly slow versus dip. falling in, you know, like if your boat's for sure going to swamp or something like that. Oh, go you, in slow versus if like... If you can get in yeah. slowly, that will help. The quicker, you know, your whole body changes temperature all at once, that's what causes the shock. I know Got that it. mental mm. state definitely affects that because, you know, all the years going surfing out at uh, Barry Glacier, uh, the folks that I would surf with would surf way more than me, and they would be way more adjusted to getting into the water than me. Mm. And it wasn't just going slow. You know, it was just like they knew what to expect. They knew it was going to come out of that, and they knew that they could, like, breathe out of it, um, where, like, it was a much more of a shock to me. Yeah. yeah. No matter how like tough you are, I'm the best swimmer or whatever. If you're just not used to that shock factor, that's that thing that you just can never really. And it doesn't matter, dude. For, like I said, like, when I fell in that gold can, oh, it was yeah. a hot, beautiful day. All you know, you fall in there, dude. It's just like you're just Light panicked switch. right yeah. away, dude. Yeah. Survival and then, mode. Uh, yep. Being fully clothed too is another thing. People think, oh, I'm a good swimmer. I don't know how to swim, so I don't need to wear this life jacket. Um. But if yeah, if you get your boots and you're fully oh, clothed, man, I mean, no if way. you're out boating in Alaska, even in the summer, you're likely wearing layers and pants and coats and a hat and yep. all these things, yep. and that totally changes to your ability to swim. Not even not yeah. to mention the cold. And and I had a question about that. Um, I I wear waiter pants and I keep the belt tight for that situation. Um, like I said, I've had several friends that have fallen in and have fallen in with waders that were loose chest waders and that thing just fills up and it's just like a, a a weight that just drops them down um would you guys say that wader pants with a tight belt is better for a boat than chest waders is there any sort of um research there or anything so i don't know if there's necessarily research there um it's kind of like personal preference but most chest waders come with a belt. Right. Um, so you can put that belt on. You can tighten it up. It's going to lessen the amount of water that's going to get in. And if you're wearing a life jacket, even with chest waders, even if they fill up a bit, it's going to keep you high enough that you can um, kind of like assess your situation and figure out where you need to go. Um so even if they get water in those waders, if you're wearing the proper life jacket for you, it will keep you high enough to like kind of figure out where you need to go to kind of get yourself out of that situation. Yeah. And some of those safety classes, I know you said you went to one, and let's say you fall in with the chest waders. Do they say to try to pull them off or cut them off the or, one, just, or the, just try to like get to shore? Everything that I read and uh, have been taught is that you keep the waders on, but you have to make sure the belt is taut, and then you lean back in your life jacket and try to float with your feet downstream. Yeah, so um, if you, especially if you land in a river, you always want to point your feet downstream, keep them up, um, mm. so feet up, seat right. um, kind of thing. Now, uh, with the waders, it you really just want to make sure you have that belt on. Um, that's like the biggest thing with waiters. We don't deal a whole lot with waiters um, because a lot of times we're just dealing with everyday kind of boaters, but you guys are all on the rivers during hunting seasons and fishing seasons. So you guys are wearing waiters all the time. Oh, absolutely. Um, I've fallen in with waiters before. Um, I had neoprene waiters though, so mine were a little yeah, different. They're very um, buoyant. Yeah, they're a little bit more buoyant, and because they're taut to your skin, there's going to be less. Um, it's all about oh, like kind of preference with waiters, just with the life jackets, kind of chest waders, pant waders. Um, but you do want to keep stuff on because uh, it's mm. going to help protect you temperature-wise. Mm. So a lot of people think, eh, my clothes are going to like weigh me down. They're not. Your life jacket is going to float you whether you have the clothes on or not. Mm -hmm. So the best thing is to keep those li those clothing on, keep the waders on. It's going to keep you warmer, and yeah. especially if you have that belt nice and taut around the middle. Yeah. All the waiter fatalities I've heard of all had to do with not wearing a, a life jacket. Mm. Yeah just personally yeah that's a that's a big thing across the board for alaska especially i mean for everywhere but um i think i think i was looking at just the last three years maybe i looked and pulled the statistics and it was over 90 percent of the people who died in boating accidents in alaska in the last three years were not wearing like okay and that's mm. pretty typical we usually say it's nine out of ten are adult males not wearing life jacket so that's our that's our demographic um, right. 
For Makes sure. sense though. So I have a little story that goes along, like is a good comparable to your event. Cause I was on both these trips. Um, so I was on the trip with Dan- Daniel hot day mm-hmm. when Daniel fell in. Um, and we are, our rafts were much further downstream and we didn't see you until you weren't, um, you were real cold. Um, the other event that happened was on, uh, like a 40 year storm type thing where we went from a nice day into like an ultra flood stage within 24 hours and the river had come up. I don't know, double at least where the water was like flowing into alder trees. And so the river's real fast. It's real muddy. Everyone's appropriately clothed. Everyone has, um, their life jackets on the outside and um, I hit a rock on an inside bend, which is usually pretty calm, really close to where you fell in, mm. like w- within like a half mile. <clears throat> and this person, this gal, um, very close to me, flew off the front, uh, my friend's little sister, and was flowing, floating towards kind of the alder trees. And so I forward paddled um, her husband, Trent, through the rope. And we grabbed her before she went into the alder trees and she was back paddling and we got her out of the water and, you know, this, it's really cold. It's July. It's been pouring for 24 hours, like real pouring, um, not like the normal rain we get here. Um, and immediately went into like de-dressing her and getting her dry clothes on. And then she was okay. Uh, but the downstream from, from us was another boater who uh, was in a one-man cataract who didn't fall in, who was in this weather and was appropriately dressed with rain gear and stuff. But just being on the water that long, that person actually got hyperthermia. So it was really interesting to like catch up to them. And they had already been for probably two hours on shore taking care of this person. And so he was coming back by the time we got there um, and his body temperature was coming up um, to see the difference on like okay well this other person actually fell in the water got completely wet but we got them out of the water right away we dried them off we put dry clothes on and then you have this other person who was just in the elements never hit the water and they ended up in hyperthermia Mm. i i thought that was a, a really a valuable lesson to me and since then whenever i fall in if i'm not in shorts weather um i change so if i can't wear shorts and they dry out it's like, okay, I'm going to go to shore right now, even though I don't think I need to. And I'm going to put on these dry clothes and probably layer up more than I would have normally. Yeah. And, and another thing, thing that we always do and, and whenever we go rafting is I just keep a dry bag that has a full set from sock right. to shirt of dry stuff um, for myself and my wife and my kids. Um, that's just like the whole boat flips over. Everything's wet. Everything's in the water. I can, you know, hopefully that thing's close right. and then we can change, yeah. you yeah. know, into that. Another big thing <clears throat> I've been doing it the last like five years, I, I take a beach towel um, for myself in case I fall in. I'm prepared to fall in anytime. Extra clothes, extra gear. But the towel to me is like, I haven't had to do it yet, but I'm thinking I fall in the water, I jump out, I'm soaked. I'm going to treat it like I just got out of a cold bath. I'm going to strip it all off, dry completely off. Oh, get yeah. all that water off my body. Before you put the dry stuff Before on. Before yeah. you put the dry clothes That's on. Now, now if you don't have the option, you just put the dry clothes on and you go through the process. But I just feel like the towel is that one extra thing. I literally lay it flat, folded in my dry bag, so it's taking up almost no space. Mm. It almost serves as like any extra padding. Okay. So you put it in the bottom. You can load a bunch of heavy-ass gear in there and kind of toss it around and it can rub and it's not just you know there's like a towel in there but it serves like a whole nother purpose or you go up to a nice hot beach you can lay it out in the sand or the rocks and you can sit on it or whatever it serves a lot more um you know you know uh purposes but i just feel like that might help you get warmer even 20 minutes faster maybe like yeah. it could be the difference yeah, you could dry off it could right be the away. difference of somebody maybe surviving or not i mean not to mention totally. it could be a blanket it can just like yeah so that's one thing i would advise anybody find an old towel beach towel or bathroom towel in your cabinet everybody has one it's kind of old you don't use it anymore you're almost about to tear it up and use it for rags or something just throw it in your dry bag and just have it for that yeah. Yeah. situation yeah. So, Good idea. Yep. Yeah. REI has those like really light, ultra light camping towels and mm-hmm. bring that anyway for a bath, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's just something 
tidbits you pick up and you figure I love it. Hand me, hand yeah. me it's a great idea. Yeah. Um well we've 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 gone a good time here. What's let's before we wrap it up, where can people if they want to go to a class or maybe have you guys come out to do a class for their scouts or for their school district class or just do you guys do even family things? Like what where can we find this information and Yeah, you can um so on a homepage of our website at the bottom there's a calendar that's gonna typically have most oh, of our that classes out. That's on it. Sweet. Yeah. Um we post about any kind of events or classes that we're doing on social media so you can follow us on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. Um and then as far as if you're wanting to reach out and schedule a class or an event or you want us to come out and do something, um you can reach out to us on social media. We'll see that or you can email office of boating safety at alaska.gov and that will get to us and we can um we do all kinds of different styles and sizes of events and classes um we do offer our main classes for adults for those listening would be um the alaska Waterwise class which is like a full like nasba approved boating safety class it's used to be like eight hours and now we kind of have moved it to be this sort of hybrid online class because of COVID and that tends to work better for people. So we've been doing it weekday evenings, two different evenings in the week, and that'll get you that boater safety card insurance on your boat insurance or discount on your boat insurance and stuff. Um, And that covers everything that we've talked about today and more. Um, And then if you're interested in paddling, we're doing a new cold water paddling class that's hands-on at the pool. um, And that those are both free classes. Um, You can find more information about that on our social media or on our website. Nice. And the social media is at Alaska Boating Safety. Yep. Yeah. Or on Facebook, it's Alaska <clears throat> Boating Safety Program. And, and before we go, we talked a little bit real quick before we got started. And, and you guys, the program, you went to Nikiski, you guys travel around, you do all this really cool stuff. And you do real life situations in pools or, or cool water, cold water situations where you're going to roll a canoe or you're going to flip a raft. You guys actually... Um, what did you use the word? What was it? Choreograph. You guys, you guys are like an organized, like. So yeah, um, in the pool. Um, so their adult paddle class that they use, they um, practice with multiple different vessels with kids. Is that the Alaska Waterwise class? That's is the it? paddle oh, class. Oh, okay. In the Alaska Waterwise class, you said is an adult. Yeah. So okay. the water, uh, the Waterwise class, pretty much goes over the Alaska Boaters Handbook. It goes over okay. um, kind of. A lot with um, like regulations, what you need to have, uh, what you should have for different styles of boats. Um, it goes over all the sort of information. It goes over cold water, goes over life jackets, like your pre departure checklist. Um, that's your the safety one. Talk. That's like, the one. That that's... one goes over pretty much everything. Okay. Um, cold water paddling is what you guys were actually out choreographing, organizing, and doing with kids and so the cold water oh. paddling is an adult class oh the okay. kids don't float educational program is the pool set um we teach multiple lessons through that program the first lesson is cold water and life jackets the second lesson is passenger safety and then we also offer a pool session that follows those classes you can do um just cold water or you can do both cold water and passenger safety we tend to save the passenger safety for the slightly older kids just because they understand um we practice mayday calls we go over Mm. float plans um that sort of stuff like the questions you should ask on a boat um and then the pool session um, we typically have four stations. Um, one we call man overboard, which kind of like talks about the throwable device, how to get someone back on the boat, like never reach for them with your hand, use something else. Um, if they can't get themselves in the boat, them, um, without help. And then we have the life jacket station where we go over all the different styles of life jackets. The kids get the opportunity to change out life jackets and try that offshore life jacket, try the float coat. They get to try these different life jackets in the water with us um, just so they get a feel for what those feel like. And we usually have a clothing station where the kids go to the clothing station and we have them put on um, some clothing that we have out that – and then for the older kids, we have them try to swim to their life jacket, get their life jacket on. Like, so if you're not wearing your life jacket and you fall overboard, you're fully dressed. You have to get that life jacket on. Um, for the younger kids, we just have them put the life jacket back on over their clothes. Um, and then they practice swimming around, kind of see how it feels if you were to fall in fully dressed. Um, and a lot of the kids, especially if they start at one of the other stations, they realize like, hey, I'm a lot warmer with my clothes on um, mm. in this pool. So 
it's really kind of cool to sh just show them the differences. And then um, the last station we have is the canoe station. And um, in that station, we have an instructor and we talk about how you would get into the boat um, normally. So you'd have three points of contact because it's a small canoe. And then we have them get in the water and then we show them how they would reboard the vessel. So um, like putting your arms out, kicking, pulling yourself across the gunnel, like getting in, staying low. And at that station, it kind of just shows them how to do it. We tend to put um, a lot of kids in one boat, and then we slowly let it swamp. We don't do any flipping or rolling because it's safety precaution. But it just kind of shows them what it feels like when the boat starts to go down. Um, and with that, it's just like telling them, like, you got to, like, kind of stay calm, um, kind of see what it goes on. Because that might be able to explain um, a little bit more about it. I tend to work with the clothing and the life jackets a lot more. Do you have anything to add to the canoes? But you also do the paddle class. Yeah, no, so that's great. Um, I would say, you know, I would really encourage people when you're getting started. I know this is, like, all so much information. There's, like, a million things we didn't even cover today. So oh, yeah. I would say take a we class. If you're feeling overwhelmed, hours. you know, and you just don't know where to start, like, take a class. So you can take one of our classes. There's a lot of online classes that are some that are free, some that, you know, you can pay for, that you can just do at your own pace and, you know, work through them if you don't have time to, like, sign up or you're not free when we're offering classes. So those are out there. Um, you can check our website for the other ones. There's like, um, you know, Boat Ace Boater and Boat US and all kinds of things. Um, but take a class, do your research, make sure you know the legal requirements too. We didn't really get to touch on that, but that's really important. You know, there are things you're legally required to have on your boat. Um, even, um, you know, kayaks, canoes, and paddle boards are legally considered vessels under the law. So, you know, we were talking about alcohol earlier. So a lot of people don't know because there's no required education for boaters in Alaska, the laws that pertain to drinking and driving pertain to boat operators. So if you're operating a vessel, and that could be even, again, a kayak, canoe, or paddleboard, and you're intoxicated, that's against the law. And so a lot of people don't know stuff like that. Um, so just, you know, we have this real easy little summary card here. It's the Alaska Requirement Summary, and that'll just show you, you know, based on the size of your boat, what you need to have on board. Mm. And have um, a registration flares, like if it's a certain, yeah, yeah. fire extinguishers, you mm. know, or, you know, for some of them, if it's just a kayak, you know, it might just be life jackets and this, a sound producing device, but that's mm -hmm. the law, you know, and so do your research. And then once you're out there, I would say that if I can just leave you guys with like two most important things you can do to increase your chances of a successful rescue, or maybe three things, <laughs> there's so many would be wear your life jacket all mm -hmm. the time. Just always wear it. Um, Carry some way to call and signal for help on your person. So not just like in a bag, but like something is Clip attached to you. To you. Mm -hmm. So whether that's a radio, a beacon, a phone, whistle, f light, mirror, all those things, keep those devices on you and um, make sure you have filed a float plan. So that can be as simple as you texted somebody, this is where I'm going, this is, you know, hey, we're heading out from this launch and this is when we expect to be back. Or it could be more official. You can fill out a whole form. You can do it online. You can do it physically. Just somebody knows that this is the time you're supposed to be back. And so if you don't come back, they can initiate that search and rescue process of trying to figure out if something happened to you. Um, and that's, that's really important just because we go out so often in the summer mm -hmm. and we, you know, if you're not doing that and you don't come home and nobody knows where you went or yeah. where to st even start looking for you or what kind of boat you're on, um, that's going to really slow down that process. And that mm. that goes along with the inner thing we've been talking about for yep. months is, um, mm -hmm. well, since episode one is, you know, that float plan happens when you get an in reach and you send out your tracking to your friends. And so everyone in Alaska doing this kind of stuff should have an in reach yep. or mm. in it. It serves as that, that, you know, float plan. They know where you're at. They know when you should be back and when you stopped. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have a plan. Yeah. Tell someone where you're going. Yeah. I Even do if have it's just ten percent of a plan. It's something. Yeah. And that ten percent, you can cover those three things. Let somebody know where you're going. Wear your life jacket, and then have a way to a signal. signal. A signal. Like the whistle is really nice. Like <clears throat> having that waterproof whistle, the one that you know doesn't need it doesn't get clogged up with air and it's just like mm -hmm. in your pocket carabiner it on your yeah it just yeah. stays attached to your life jacket or whatever yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. we usually say like carry one communication device at least hopefully you have 
you know, a multiple means of backup, but, and then something to signal. So like you've used your inReach and hit that SOS button, you know, and someone's coming and then you have a light or a sound to right. get them right to where you are, mm, kind of yeah. pairing those two together. Yeah, because you could be nooked in something that they're like, okay, he's in this area. Or they are in this area, but in it's like, where ocean. are they? Yeah. Right, exactly. So the yeah. personal locator beacons, those um, satellite beacons that you can get, those have like a homing signal mm -hmm. for rescuers, so they, they can, can really get narrow right it to down. You. Mm -hmm. But the, I don't think the inReach or other satellite bases do that. So you got to have some other way, yeah, mm -hmm. like a flare even to show. Sure, them. sure. Yeah, especially in the middle of the night, dark. The the inReach yeah. does as long as it doesn't die. Mm -hmm. So once you send the SOS, it can they can track where you're going, where you're moving. Yeah, we can't big up the the inReach anymore. I mean, it's the best thing you can have, dude. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's mm -hmm. like you can communicate, yeah. you can SOS, you can track, you can send. It's text waterproof. Text it's cheap. People. That battery lasts forever. It does and last it, a and long time. It's just time. in addition to your multiple use items. Yeah, it's it's that and then the whatever the, yeah. the two or three other things and it's things all about have. where you're going too you know you could have mm -hmm. a marine vhf radio if you're going to be out in prince william sound or somewhere where there's other boats mm -hmm. but if you're going out to the yukon river where there's no one else with a radio around it doesn't make any that sense yeah. so you gotta just yeah. think about where you're going and research yep, yep. Yeah, and the floating cool. radio makes a lot of sense i've seen so many people go out on their like paddleboard or whatever and drop the radio and it's just in the bottom and then you can, for a hundred bucks, you can get the floating one. It's well, once you get that yeah. one, yeah, might save your life. Yeah, yeah, you don't know. Um, well, Cosette, Olivia, thank you for all the information. Yeah. You guys are great, man. Thank yeah. you for yeah. coming thank by. You. Um, if anyone wants to find any more information on this, um, once again, uh, the website is alaskaboatingsafety.org. Alaskaboatingsafety.org, and the Instagram is at Alaska Boating Safety. Yeah. Um, office office of boating safety that's that's, that's the spot huh mm -hmm. that's it that's the spot real quick what is the head count on the staff there do you guys got a a lot of folks there so we've got joe who's our boating law administrator for the state yeah annie is our education coordinator then there's me olivia we have alec and then we have iris out in the matsu valley so the rest six? of us are in anchorage and that's it wow so we rely really heavily on our like partners Oh. And so we have we work really closely with the Coast Guard, State Park, State Troopers, and then all of our other partners and other safety organizations that are in part of like the Loner Board program or help us teach. There are a lot of kids don't float like certified instructors or Alaska Waterwise instructors throughout the state. Um, you know, and you know if that's something that you're interested in too, we can even like train people in your organization to teach the course, and so that helps us because wow. you know we reach like the villages and all kinds of places, and obviously can't do all of that mm -hmm. our, our ourselves. And 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 uh, folks like ourselves and the public can contact you guys and sign up and get on and and maybe if we don't know how to instruct we can at least just tag along yeah we and take be part of it and, and especially at those pool sessions um it's yeah. super helpful to have extra people around yeah. and sure yeah yeah it, it sounds really cool like i i feel like it's almost like your due diligence as a boater with especially if you're a parent and you have kids and you're out yeah recreating on the water it, it almost feels like an obligation to just be part of that and 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 part of the cause and the solution or Whatever's going to improve anybody's chance of um, surviving when playing on the water, right? Yep. Yep. So, so important. Yep. Well, thank you for coming out, ladies. Thank you for having we us. We really appreciate yeah. you. Um, remember, Alaska kids don't float, adults mm -hmm. don't either, and wear it. You remember my speaking to you of what I call your overcaution. Are you not overcautious when you assume that you cannot do what the enemy is constantly doing? The Alaska Wild Project podcast is brought to you by the following sponsors. The Bait Shack, located on Ship Creek upstream of the bridge. Can't miss the bright red shack. They are the go-to fishing gear rental and guide service on Ship Creek. Tight lines and fish on. Come hook into the action with them. Hit them up at thebaitshackak.com. Lawn Pro AK, your year-round professional property maintenance company, providing services such as weekly lawn maintenance, driveway sweeping, snow and ice management, and tons more. Get your free estimate today at LawnProAK.com. Anchortown Dogs, located at 4th Avenue across from the old 4th Avenue Theater. Look for the blue and gold umbrella. From reindeer dogs to bomb euros, they've got you covered. 
Anchor Town Dogs, your local gourmet hot dog and sausage cart. Menegato's Accounting, locally owned and operated advisory and tax accounting solutions. Passion, experience, diligence. Learn more at menegatosaccounting.com. Double Shovel Cider Company, located off Arctic and 58th. Handcrafted Alaskan made cider. They also have a tap room downtown on the corner of 5th and E. Check them out at doubleshovelcider.com. Serrano's Mexican Grill, two locations, one on Tudor, one on Northern Lights. The Northern Lights location has their new tequila bar. Check it out. Also see their daily specials at serranosmexicangrill.com. AKO Farms, located in Sitka, Alaska. Built from the ground up with concentrates as their single motivation. Find their products such as their sugar wax, full spectrum diamond sauce carts, and more at the Treehouse AK and other dispensaries around the state. Ask your local bud tender about AKO. TheTreehouseAK.com, located at 341 Boniface Parkway. Your all-in-one cannabis and CBD store. Ask the bud tender what the strain of the day is to get your 10% off. The Treehouse, where the culture lives. Marijuana has intoxicating effects and may be high performing and addictive. Marijuana impairs concentration, coordination, and judgment. Do not operate a vehicle or machine under the influence. There are health risks associated with consumption of marijuana. For the use of only by adults 21 and older. Keep out of the reach of children and marijuana should not be used by women who are pregnant or breastfeeding. Tailored Restoration 24-Hour Emergency Home Services. Helping Alaskans restore their dreams since 1972. Services include fire, water, mold, post-emergency cleaning, repair, and remodeling. Give them a call in Anchorage, Eagle River, Matsu, or Fairbanks. Hit them up at tailoredrestorationalaska.com.